Okay, let me start recording here. Recording in progress. Okay, recording is running. We're good to go. Uh, good evening. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Midcoast Community Council for May 11th, 2022. This meeting is conducted entirely remotely tonight. Um, we had begun, we had talked about having a hybrid meeting starting today, but we had some facilities uh, problems in terms of having a place to meet. So we're, we're going to continue online at this point. Um, so, Len, would you please call the roll? Sure. Dave? Here. Michelle? Here. Jill? Here. Dan? Here. Greg? Here. Claire? Here. I'm here, seven present. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, are there re reports from any government agencies? Uh, Lena? Yeah, I've got one. And uh, if we do turn to hybrid, I would love to meet Dan, Jill, and Dave in person sometime. That would be awesome. And the rest of you I met once, I'll meet you again. That's fine. <laughs> um, all right. So, um, as I think everyone may know, uh, our COVID levels are rising. Um, in San Mateo County, we're now categorized as medium. Um, similar transmission as we had last summer, but with just much lever, much lower levels of hospitalization um, due to the vaccine. Uh, so I'm just going to read directly from a report we got from the board. Uh, the state is adapting some of the COVID-19 testing sites in support uh, of partnerships with local health departments, uh, such as the one in the College of San Mateo, to serve as test treatment sites. Um, these complimentary sites will basically help you if you test positive. They'll also give you a plan of action moving forward. And I'm going to find out if there's anything on the coast side, but I don't believe there is at this point. Yeah, Ken Hancock, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and somewhere in Pacific on Thursday. Although I was their first treat patient today, and, and they're not quite there yet. Gotcha. Thank you, Dave. Um, so, yeah, Dave, if we can talk offline, I would love to hear about your experience. Um, and then for the vaccine, it was reported that the Moderna has applied for authorization for six, six months to age five, um, which would we would probably expect approval in about the summer. Um, and one of the focuses, uh, focus areas uh, for vaccine outreach that continues to be Half Moon Bay and the coast side in general. Um, so I'll put some numbers um, in the chat as well uh, after the fact. Uh, there were some questions about the project um, at Graywell Cove. Um, it's, the, it's the road improvement project uh, that would go towards the, the state park. Um, I have no good news on this. Um, I asked another staff member who's been working on it, and what I've been told is that um, there's just been a back and forth with Caltrans on who would maintain the the, the work once it's been completed, um, and neither the county nor Caltrans is willing to maintain um, that that area. I mean, because I'm from the county, I can say what our perspective is, which is it's 100% Caltrans right of way and it leads to a state park. So it really just wouldn't be make any sense for us to do that maintenance. Um, and due to that, and also um, shortfalls in funding that we've been unsuccessful with, uh, with improving, the supervisor has directed his staff to just focus on other projects that are further along and closer to completion as he turns out in December, uh, January 1st. Um, and then um, I just wanna let you guys know that uh, the supervisor is working on a minimum wage increase in the unincorporated county. Uh, that would not take effect until January 1st, and we're going to do extensive outreach, but I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Uh, it's looking like it'll be uh, $15.50 an hour for employers of 25 or less and $16.50 an hour for employers of 26 or more. Uh, this is really consistent with what most of the cities have done when they've tried to, to make a more accurate uh, minimum wage 
Um, and I just want to say that there was a lot of uh, things brought up at the last meeting for me. I've done some follow-ups. Uh, I contacted the sheriff's office regarding the Montero Park lot that we were seeing the donuts done on. Um, I've discussed with the supervisor the propane filling station, and uh, he wants to to think about it a little bit more and then uh, get back to, to you guys, and I'll, I'll pass that on. But I'm um, still following up on a couple questions from some of the council members and some of the community and I'll get that uh, as soon as I can. Um, and I would love to take questions. Are there any questions for Lena? Uh, yeah, well, Len? Uh, Len? Uh, so is, is the uh, supervisor in effect saying, you know, really I'm, I'm done with this. Uh, I'm gonna concentrate on other things. So we should expect no progress in Great Whale Cove until next year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, unless some other office would be doing something, and I, our office has been the catalyst for for trying to make progress on it, so I wouldn't foresee that happening. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sid, you have a question for Lena? Yes, I was going to ask. I just tuned in three minutes late, and you were already talking about what um, the county wasn't going to take on, but I'm assuming it was the Gray Whale Cove crossing. Yes. Exactly. Yay. <laughs> I don't think they should spend any money on it. They have postponed stuff down here where residents live for a long time. And it like that's only visitor serving and it only goes to a state beach. So I'm glad they're not going to do it. They should permanently not do it. Let Caltrans pay for it. Um, I did go by Quarry Park today because I wanted to see the pump track. And I have a question for you. Um, I'll maybe wait till the meeting of the 25th and unless you can find out sooner. Um, my understanding is whenever there's a big project like that with lots of construction and earth moving, that they're supposed to water down all the roads so when the trucks come in and out, they're not um, creating a ton of dust. And there were lots of, uh, I call them dust devils that were swirling in the wind today. It was a little breezy. And do you know, is the county exempt from doing that? Because normal developers are not. I don't okay. think we are, and I, I can try and I can find out about them. You know, you said before the next meeting. I mean, I talked to one person. They they not from the county, just a neighbor, and they said it might be the cost of water. But I know they might be on water restrictions, but some of this area isn't because we don't get ours from Hetch Hetchy. Maybe the county brings in water from somewhere else. I don't know, but I don't um, believe so. And I'll follow up and let you know, Sid, because that's a good okay. question. And um, I'm assuming because you were kind of under the weather last time that you didn't at get a chance to talk with Steve Monowitz about the following up on uh, the the mitigation fee. Uh, raising and also the accounting all the way back from 2016 it's supposed to be reported to the board of supervisors each year how much they collected and what they spent it on it's, it's supposed to go into an interest bearing account and they're supposed to raise the rate uh, periodically but i haven't heard anything now i do keep asking so i will be keeping to ask but did he mention to you anything why he hasn't done it no, I think it's more of a staffing issue than anything else. Yeah, well, he's he's the head of the planning department, so I would think he could make some staff time for that. Oh, sure. Okay. sure. Well, let's move along at this yeah, point. Yeah, I am moving along. I'm going to keep bringing it up, so maybe you can answer it next time. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, anything else for Lena? If not, we'll go on to Harvey, please. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, at the last council meeting, we uh, heard about and approved our beach action plan for this upcoming summer uh, season. Uh, you know, this has really been a problem. Uh, traffic is horrible, especially on the weekends. Uh, so the city is trying to be proactive. We're going to have extra deputies. Uh, we're going to try to have uh, more enforcement at uh, the intersection of Highways 92 and uh, one, uh, there's going to be uh, extra restrooms uh, at the end of Kelly. We're working with state parks to have more restrooms at the um, uh, state parks uh, north of the city. We're gonna have more signage trying to direct people to go north so that they don't um, all uh, uh, congregate at Poplar. Um, we're going to have more deputies on the beach, uh, faster response to um, 
any, any sort of incidents, uh, more trash cans. Uh, so the city is, is aware of the issues with uh, the uh, influx of, uh, uh, of tourists uh, on uh, in the summer, especially on the weekends. And we're doing what we can, but it, it's really a tough problem. So that's my main uh, thing that I've learned that affects the mid coast. And I'll be glad to answer any questions about anything that's related to the city. Uh, looks like Sid has a question for Harvey. Go ahead. I thought I hit on mute. Okay, Harvey, um, I know it's coming up on the agenda for the mid coast, but um, they wanted to put all those uh, digital signs up along Highway 1 from Pacifica to Half Moon Bay, actually Daly City to Half Moon Bay. And um, don't you think a better use of those would be on 92 to let people know when there's accidents or delays? Because twice this week we had um, delays that never even got put into SMC alert. Yeah, I I heard from Caltrans sort of indirectly that they agree that the signs, the VMS, the variable message signs on Highway One are temporarily scotched. Good. Uh, people have brought up on more than one occasion that the proper place to put them would be uh, much further uh, away on Highway Ninety Two when people actually can make decisions about whether or not they want to come to the coast okay well that's i know you guys aren't part of tonight's meeting but it's on our agenda but it's not for half moon bay okay thank you very much sure okay anyone else for harvey if not uh, barbara die has a report i just have a couple things uh if people are interested we're having an update on next thursday the 19th at the granada community services meeting on some um minor revisions to the Burnham Park master plan. Uh, everything that has been approved by the board based on all the community input we did is still in there. We've had to move things around a little bit based on the engineers and the drainage requirements. So um, if you're interested in seeing the latest plan, we've also made some or looking at making a few revisions to integrate the park and the commu new community center uh, so if you're interested in those minor changes, we will be presenting them next week. Also, I just wanted to comment um, that the community center that we have hired a uh, group for to design the community center, they've done community centers all over the peninsula and in bigger area. They're very well regarded and we're looking forward to working with them. This community center will be open to the whole coast side. So I, I think that issue has been raised, but uh, we're looking forward to having something that will serve the entire community. Thanks. It's good news, Barbara. Are there any yeah. other questions for Barbara? No? Is, are there any other um, hands up. reports? Lynn, you have a question for Barbara? Yes. So, Barbara, if uh, everything went well with your projects, uh, how soon would you expect Burnham Park and the community center to be online? Are we talking about like two to three years? What, what kind of time frame? Probably. You know, we, we are also just about to go out for a CEQA consultant. So that, that analysis will have to be done before we're ready to submit to the county. Uh, we are, as I reported at a couple meetings back, we will be having, uh, we've hired a engineering consultant, which is working with KNK Designs, our landscape architects uh, on the, they're working on the, the grading plans, the drainage plans, and the parking plans. So all the things are getting done. It Everything takes time. And uh, I'd like to say two years, but I, that may be over-optimistic. Understand. Thank you. Okay, Sid, you have a question for Barbara? Yes, Barbara. Um, I keep hearing about sea level rise and relocating Highway 1. Do you guys have a contingency plan if Caltrans suddenly decides to move Highway 1 over and take up some of the Burnham Strip with that highway? Um, that, that's an important question. We met with Caltrans early on in the process, and they said they have no plans in the immediate future to move Highway 1 there. 
There are other options for moving Highway 1 further inland that might make more sense and, uh, you know, not, not require taking away the park. Um, having said that, the main improvements we will be making will be to add a restroom. You know, it'll be medium sized with outside showers. We're not going to be putting anything in there that would really preclude it, except that I think once we have a wonderful park, I'm not sure people are going to want to see it go away. But uh, in terms of sea level rise, I don't think that creating this park prevents Caltrans from looking at various options and doing what makes sense with respect to that issue. Well, I mean, when it's many years since I worked on the fireworks committee, but that's when I first became aware that Highway 1 is divided right down the middle and one half is Half Moon Bay on the west side and the other side is unincorporated. So, you know, knowing the problems we've been having with Half Moon Bay and the sewer, I'd hate to see you guys put all this work and energy into the Burnham Strip and then have Half Moon Bay try to do eminent domain or any other kind of crazy stuff. So I just thought I, think, I, I don't think Half Moon Bay would play a role in this at all. Um, there is a very large um, Caltrans right-of-way that extends. When, when you look at the Burnham Park plan, there is a very um, significant section that we are not touching that is between the park and the highway. So How that big? is actually a space that they could, in fact, move into. Okay. Um, so How wide is that? Uh, I don't know. I, what comes to mind is 70 feet, but I'm not sure. Okay, I guess that's a little bit like that way. Thanks. And that's an issue Short with respect to other. Um, we'll be presenting a map. Yes, you'll it's see. It's 150. It later. It's 150 feet because I had my skate ramp there for eight years. Okay, thank you, Michelle. I'm You're sorry, welcome. I got that wrong. <laughs> yes, it's a pretty significant way, and if you look at the strip now, you can see there's markers at the edge of the Caltrans right of way. So we are only proposing to make improvements up to that line. Okay. Um, anybody else have questions for Barbara? And if not, is there anybody else that has a report that they want to make? Not hearing any, we'll move on to public comment. Oh, Sabrina, you had a question for, for uh, Barbara, Sabrina? Actually, I just have a, a question about where we are in the meeting, because I just joined. Um, are you, have, have you gotten to agenda items yet? Nope. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're, we're finishing up reports from government officials. Uh, Kimberly, did you have a question for Barbara? I do not, I wanted to say something for public comment. Okay, we'll get to that right now. Um, so we're gonna open for public comment for up to three minutes comments on anything not on the agenda and what's on the agenda are various highway issues, uh, some issues with RCD and Barbara's history uh, lesson. Um, so anything other than that, Kimberly, go ahead. Oh, thank you, Claire. Um, I just wanted to let you all um, make you aware that Surf Rider has a new um, policy lead for plastics in the county. And her name is Karen Madsen. Some of you might know her. Um, she's worked with several football groups. Yeah, Karen's great. So she's gonna be our local Surf Rider chapter's policy lead on plastics pollution. And I know that, that this body had an interest in that. And she's gonna be spearheading some outreach on the California Recycling and Plastic Pollutions Reduction Act, which is coming up in November on the ballot. So if any of you have questions or have interest in that, um, I can put you in touch with Karen or you may encounter her out in the community and I just wanted to let you know that. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Kimberly. Uh, Sabrina. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I wanted to comment on something that does have to do with Highway 1, but is not related to the agenda items regarding Highway 1 tonight. Um, but I thought it was pertinent to bring it up, uh, especially since um, you're going to be discussing a um, what it looks like a draft negative deck um, related to Highway 1. 
So um, as you know, we have a very uh, substandard, unsafe Highway 1 crossing located in Moss Beach. That location is the site of multiple accidents, including I remember a young boy who was struck by a vehicle when he was on foot trying to cross the highway. Um, I believe he was uh, trying to get over to the Taqueria. Um, and unfortunately he lost his leg and isn't gonna be able to play or can't play basketball um, the way that he used to. So um, in light of all of the things that have happened at that um, site, I, I think it's an absolute urgent emergency that the Midcoast Council and the county um, get this on Caltrans's agenda to move forward with the safe crossing ASAP. Um, this really has got to get tackled. It's my understanding that there was never a CDP issued or a CDX for the crossing that's currently in place that is uh, totally substandard and requires people to hold a flag. Um, this is not acceptable. So um, if this has not come up um, to the Coastal Commission, I would urge you guys to write a letter to the Coastal Commission complaining about the fact that there isn't a CDP or a CDX for that crossing and that that crossing needs to be improved immediately. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sabrina. Um, any other public comment? We'll move on to the consent agenda. Uh, there are no minutes on the agenda tonight. Uh, we're, they're none available. Um, we do have one item on the consent agenda, which is to continue remote meetings for this at, for the next 30 days. Uh, Len, could you call the roll on that? Uh, I'll move that we uh, adopt the consent agenda with the minutes excluded. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be on video. Oops. Oh, Len, you're on mute. Oh. Clear? Yes. Greg? Greg? I said yes. I'm sorry you didn't hear me. Right. Dan? Yes. Myself? Yes. Jill? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Dave? Yes. Passes 7 0. Thank you. We can move on to the regular agenda. And the first item on the agenda is. Um, a variety of issues, but mostly related to highway planning. And this is sponsored by Greg Vegas and uh, Len Erickson. So I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Claire. Dave, I need to be co-host in order to show this slide presentation. Uh, you had it, but you must have dropped off. I'll fix that. You got it. Okay, and bear with me here. <laughs> Can you see that slide? No, no. How about that one? No. Well, then I'm going to skip doing, uh, how about the one I'm showing now? Can you see that? There's nothing coming up, Greg. Uh, Greg, do you have two screens by any chance? Because sometimes you're shit. I do have two screens. I do have two screens. What, what do you recommend? Um, you have to make sure you share from the right screen. And since I've never had two screens, I'm not sure how to do that. Here's yeah, I'm having trouble. Screen. Greg? It's not sharing at all. Yeah. Turn it, stop and stop sharing and start sharing again. Okay. Oh, that How's looks that? better. Much there better. That looks good. All right, well, that is not slideshow format, but we'll have to do with it, okay? Um, so what we're going to try and discuss tonight, um, I got some feedback from people who listened last week. They would have appreciated a more graphic and pictorial representation of all the projects going on, so I'm going to zip through that. Len knows more about this stuff than I do. So he's, of course, empowered to jump in. Um, we're going to focus a discussion 
on Surfers Beach. Uh, Bob Nisbet of Half Moon Bay said he could possibly join the meeting. He's up in Sacramento to represent Half Moon Bay a little later. Is Harvey still here? I don't see him, but of course he could speak up. And of course, I wanted to hear from Barbara and GCSD and the community about what they think about Surfers Beach. And then there's a host of other updates that Len will cover. Uh, and then finally, we have a letter proposed, uh, which we'll discuss and vote on at the end. So briefly, here are some of the projects that are going on. Um, we have a Highway 1 safety barrier project, which started construction just recently. You probably saw um, the trucks out there today. The good news is they were pulling up the cones by 2 p.m., but through the end of June, heading north on Highway 1 to Pacifica is going to be uh, interesting. Uh, the Medio Creek Bridge, my understanding is it's going to start next month, and the bill is now up to $4 million due to the loss of the concrete abutment, but they're still going ahead with it. Montero, we had asked for in a previous meeting, safe routes to school on five unsigned intersections in Montero. You may remember that letter. Uh, Quavo uh, advises me they've gathered their data and they're doing a study. Um, Moss Beach, there's a, uh, let me see if I can pull up the right slide for this. Is this the right one, Len? I think it is. There's a study that's going to be conducted in this region, um, involves several things, including intersections controls at the areas. We're not going to discuss that now because we're going to have a chance to comment later. There's also that crosswalk beacon. I'm not sure if that's what Trina, Sabrina was talking about on Virginia Ave. Len will give us an update on that a little later. Um, and then we have a multimodal trail, which I'm only now learning about. Um, Apparently, the first phase of the multimodal trail runs from Half Moon Bay up to about Coronado. Um, the second phase uh, is intended to run as shown on this map. Is my understand? Uh, is that Len? Do I have this right? Yeah, the multimodal trail <clears throat> goes from uh, the vicinity of the the schools uh, down to uh, Medio. A media. Okay. So. All right, great. And we don't have a funded design study for that, uh, which I asked Lena about. Um, and she, if I remember correctly, Lena speak up indicated it would be one of those things that's going to have to wait until there's a new supervisor. Um, I'm going to hope we can reach out to Don and get him to fund the design. Because can it's going to take. Uh, yeah. I think the groundbreaking is supposed to be in June. Yeah, That's um, phase you're, one. You're, you're, you're both <laughs> right. So there's a groundbreaking for phase one in June. Um, and, and Greg's asking about phase two. And what I did, what I told him is exactly what he said. It's um, the, the, the whole entire project getting to the point of groundbreaking took five and a half years for phase one. <laughs> um, and so even planning is, is kind of a huge undertaking, but in no way am I trying to dissuade the MCC from from reaching out to Don with with any desires you may have, just that's that's where we stand at this point. Okay, uh, there's also a Highway One multi-asset roadway rehabilitation project. Uh, we expect a draft environmental document in June, so we're not going to discuss that tonight. But uh, I believe they're adding a study of a mid-block crossing at Surfers Beach, uh, and we will discuss that concept tonight. And this project has removed the VMS, the variable message signs, from it. However, there, so that is, um, let me see if I can find it. This is the multi asset rehabilitation project, which includes repaving and repairing a lot of drainage and culverts um, and other stuff. And then there was a project I remember attending back in September 2020 called the Traffic Operational Systems Improvement Project, which include a whole bunch of variable message signs and wireless data um, uh, capture sensors to sense traffic. And this project uh, is the one, I believe, is before the Planning Commission on May 25th uh, and led to us drafting the letter 
after we heard that they're removing the variable message signs from the related multi-asset project, we decided it'd be a good idea to jump in and write that letter. So that's just an overview of the stuff that's going on. But if we could, I wanted to Ray, spend a minute on... Just, yes, Len. Uh, so, uh, the very first item you mentioned, I want to clarify something there. There is a major safety barriers project. It's a long-term project that's gone through uh, environmental evaluation, et cetera. But there's currently work that's being done up on the south, south of the tunnel. But that relates to some problems with the culvert and the barriers uh, at Gray Whale Cove, not at the cove itself, but there appears to be some uh, degradation of the the roadside. So that that is not, however, the the, the project that we're referencing there is a is a permanent set of uh, barriers, and that's scheduled to go into construction in 2023. Oh, thank you. Okay, um, so Surfers Beach came up in part because there's a lot going on at Surfer's Beach. Um, there are a lot of different stakeholders, uh, and I think Sid was mentioning a lot of different trails. And one of the things I've observed, and I know others have, is that surfers routinely cross the highway uh, and interrupt the flow of traffic and create uh, hazardous situations. I've seen a number of almost rear ends. Right now, the instructions are that the surfers are supposed to hike to the nearest crossing. And according to Google Maps, that nearest crossing is over a 1,000 feet in each direction plus the width of the road. So that's 2,100 feet round trip for surfers crossing barefoot and wet. And so the, the idea is that we would ask for a mid-block crossing there attempt to get it to be part of the Highway 1 multi-asset rehabilitation project. But we also need to consider that in conjunction with the fact that GCSD has their Burnham Park project. There's that bike trail on the west side of the road. There's a multimodal trail going somewhere on the east side of the road. They're going to be adding bike lanes on Highway 1. Um, so it just seems like there's a lot of stuff going on. And this slide, if you can see it, shows the strip of land that Barbara was alluding to. There's a, uh, I guess I heard Michelle say, 150 foot wide strip there between the highway and the land that GCSD will be building their park on. And right now people are parking here. Uh, excuse me, Greg. Yeah. Uh, uh, just, can I request, politely request that we um, save the uh, majority of the remaining time to discuss what is uh, most pressing uh, right now, and that is the um, the traffic, um, what is it called, the traffic operation system projects. Can we, this is, um, uh, one, one of the problems going on here is there's so many different projects. This is causing a lot of confusion for the community and myself. Um, I, I think we should be talking about one project at a time. I think the Surfers Beach uh, We'll have an opportunity in the future to see what Caltrans comes up. Uh, maybe it should be a different agenda item, but there's just so many things being discussed right now. There's not going to be enough time to give a robust discussion uh, regarding the issue that's most present. Greg, can you so, back up one slide? I'm sure. Um, um, I'd like to interrupt and point out because both Dan and Sabrina brought this up. This agenda item is a general transportation issues item, and it has an hour and a half allocated to it. So uh, I don't think it makes uh, sense to ask people to restrict it to something less than the agenda item. In, in addition, we've invited Barbara to comment. We've invited Half Moon Bay to comment, and other people are intending to speak on this. And we'll have time for the other thing, too. Could you do the Burnham Strip one that you had before? Thank you. I guess nobody's letting me speak because I was on mute. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> but you're all ignoring me. Uh, but, uh, this item, as I understand it, Greg and Lynn, is supposed to be an overview of everything so that we get a big picture, not necessarily a small picture. What I want to ask you guys is we're getting all kinds of people raising their hands and wanting to say things. Do you want them to, to jump in on this or do you want to wait? <laughs> 
I would like everybody to talk about the surfers beach issue now. And then when we finish that, Len has an update or several updates to provide. And then we talk about the BMS letter. That would be my preference. Len, do you have anything you want to say? Well, I want to say two things here. One is in talking about the surfers beach project, it, it has very large implications in terms of update to the roadway, although it's working in some fairly narrow confines. And, but at the same time, what we've heard from Barbara is that two or three years out is when they're looking to do their work on Burnham Park. From a Caltrans standpoint, the work they plan to do, the actual shovels in the dirt, so to speak, will be in about two or three years. So, but, but what they're doing now is they're part of the planning phase. So we unfortunately have the two projects a little bit different from each other in terms of planning, but what Caltrans is bringing forward here focuses exclusively on the roadway itself. So they've added in both a consideration of a mid-block crossing, not, not any commitment to do it, but it's an assessment of it. And then as we also mentioned, there was concerns about the signs, of it, the variable message signs, and those have been taken out completely. The bottom line here is though, it will be in June when they release an environmental draft environmental document that will be out for public comment for 30 days. So this is trying to set the framework for it and look at some of the particulars that might be of focus interest but from a community standpoint, the time we have things to read in detail and go a little bit deeper into it is when they release the environmental document. So that's the important item on number one. Greg, could you go back to the first slide or the second one, the one that uh, had the list? The one that has the list, yeah, this one? Yeah, that one there, that one there. So we made the clarification that the safety barrier project has done its design de development design work but it, its building target is out in 23-24. The Medio Creek Bridge, that happens this summer. The Montero, the Safe Routes to School, there's also been a Safe Routes to School walk for El Granada as well. Those are away from Highway 1, and they're more community-directed. Then the, uh, the Moss Beach Congestion and Safety Improvements Project is a focus on Moss Beach between Cypress California and down at 16th Street to look at those intersections and the road in between. This is a study process again, and that will begin sometime in midsummer. Uh, just getting they're getting consultants in place, but this will be areas that we visited before, both in terms of what goes at the intersections and what happens to the roadway in between. Okay, so that's this one. Then the uh, the Virginia afternoon. A crosswalk with this RRFB has an additional improvement being added. I think the useful thing of this intersection, since they're going to do a study for a mid-block crossing at Servers Beach, is we can have a reference point for one type of technology to use there. And the concern has been raised as to how safe is it, what should be done. And so this is an opportunity to look at that kind of detail. The multimodal trail, as Selena emphasized, the design for the, uh, the current one, the one that we're actually going to break ground on, was five years plus in the making. The lesson from that is it takes a long time. So getting the funding line up is important. I think what Don is saying is I'll be very happy to complete the first phase. And so I would, I would recommend from our standpoint to put the emphasis on getting a design work underway as uh, Lena pointed out later in the year, I think we should just focus on the execution of what they're building now. The multi-asset roadway rehabilitation I just covered, that, that, that major connection point from the community is in June when they release their draft environmental document. And the Traffic Operational Systems Improvement Project is one we commented on over a year ago. It has variable message signs and other technology, and I know, and this one is actually coming to the Planning Commission uh, at the set, their second meeting in May. So it's a live issue. Uh, and I think relative to what we're hearing that there is interest in talking about that and diving further and I support that, but I, I would like to see us go through these other pieces first, just as reference points to be clear as to what they represent. And I think as Dave noted, there's a fair bit of time on the agenda to, uh, to discuss it. Right. 
Claire, do you want to call on people or do you want me to? Probably better for Claire to see people and we can worry about answers. Claire's on mute. Claire, are you there? I muted myself again. Okay. Um, if you're ready to take comments, we can start with public comment and then move to the council. If you like, if I can do that, if you'd like. Yeah, that, that that's fine. On the Surfers Beach related issues, I would like to hear from the public and then the council. Okay, Surfers Beach only, uh, Barbara. Um, we have said from the beginning that the Burnham Park plan will connect to any proposed crossing. We will build a trail up to the uh, boundary with the Caltrans property and connect to the trail, any trail that they have there and, and then to any crossing. So that's not a, a difficult thing. They can tell us where it is. Um, again, the, the plan has changed a little bit, partly because the drainages, the engineers and the county um, required larger drainage areas than are shown in this, this map. So things had to kind of scoot around a little bit, but um, they're pretty much the same. Um, but we'll still be able to connect, I'm sure, to any kind of crossing. And then for the multimodal trail in our we had early meetings with the county about our park to make sure that there weren't to make sure that we were aware of all their constraints and, and things that we talked about. Uh, there will be a trail that will meet the requirements of the multimodal modal trail that will go through the property. It will be either the one that goes along the top and down, but more likely the one that, that goes across the uh, northern edge and then, or I mean, the eastern edge or however, the top edge on this map. Um, and then goes down and goes down to the bottom left-hand corner of the the park. Uh, we had also talked about the connection from the upper right-hand corner over to Capistrano uh, to meet the current the trail that is currently under construction. And in our preliminary discussion with the county, we had talked that they would potentially fund the construction of that piece of the trail. Um, these, these are all things that are going to be worked out. We, as I say, we will have a final plan, hopefully as soon as six months. It's hard to say because we're just getting the CEQA consultant on board now. Um, the engineers are, as I say, are at hard as work and K&K, &K, our um, landscape architects from Half Moon Bay are doing a great job. So it is all coming together. Uh, and then we'll be meeting with the county, make sure that they're okay before we submit it probably meet with Caltrans again, though there's really not a Caltrans role in our project. And then we'll go through the process. There'll be lots of opportunity for additional public comment and so forth. But it seems as if this project is just going to tie in with the transportation needs that are uh, in existence that need to go through this project. So that's where we are. Happy to take questions. Uh, I, will, I will turn... Go ahead, Lenny, you were saying? Well, just a question for you, Bob. Could you put that uh, slide back that had the project, Greg? So just the so we understand. The trails haven't changed. The trails aren't going to change really much. Oh, but just so we understand, the Caltrans right-of-way, basically your park is bounded by the Caltrans right-of-way. Is that correct? Right. We're the green part. The Caltrans right-of-way is the brown part below that. At one point, they had talked about continuing that parking area down there. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, that's for them to decide. But, but currently the parking that you're showing right there, the two loves there, all of those are in the right of way. Yeah, and that's not ours. We are showing no, I, a parking. I understand. Here. Just want to make, you know, it's good to have a visual representation of it. And then as long as we're talking parking, we will have, we are not able to maintain the parking lot on this property in the current concurrent position because of the adjacent wetlands area and the required setback. You can have park facilities in the setback from the wetlands, but you can't have parking. So the parking has just moved a bit over to um, the middle, you know, a little bit over in the project. And we, we will have the same number of parking places available in this project um, as are available on our property now. Okay. Okay. Um, 
I will call on Sid in a second uh, to make comments, but I do want to say that public comment is limited to three minutes. And the reason that Barbara got a lot, got more than that is because she's part of the planning and not, not part of the public. Okay, Sid, your, your comments. Yeah, I thought it was for questions about this um, Highway 1 crossing area. And she went on, she didn't ask a question. She was going on about her plan. So Sid, Sid. Um, back to my oh, question. Sid. Sid. Wait. You can't hear me? I can hear you. You can't hear me. Uh, I just said Barbara was not making a public comment. She was part of the planning process. Right. She wasn't asking a question, which is what I thought we said we were doing. So now that we know where the Burnham Strip project is going, um, there was that picture that was up a minute ago, and it looked like the only point that was shown in the Caltrans right away. There might be other parking, but I don't see it designated that in this gray room. rectangle in the middle. See that? Oh, so that's a parking lot, not that's a, a building lot. or something. Okay, no, that's thank a you. parking lot. So, sure. and there's also um, I want a Zoom meeting. parking bays. Okay. Can somebody mute Jill or whoever that is talking it's in the Sabrina. background. <laughs> Uh, go ahead, Barbara. Sorry. No, I'm just saying, and there, there's also additional parking. There's some changes to the parking um, in the plan that we'll be pr uh, pr uh, showing next Thursday. But that little ad hoc parking lot that's like near where surfers park a lot, that's on Caltrans property, and that's permitted or unpermitted? Part of it is on Caltrans property. Part of it isn't on our property. We I'm will talking about the brown area parking lot. That's, that's Caltrans. It's permitted or not permitted? I don't know. It's Cal Caltrans. Okay. Property. Okay. So now I'm going to ask my questions, Claire. I'm sorry. We were oh, you're, 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 you've got about a minute left. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Um, since I wanted to talk about the crosswalk, the Greg mid mid block crosswalk at the um, Highway One across from Burnham Park. Uh, it's not designated where that would be exactly, but a long time ago when I first moved here, there was parking on both sides of Highway 1, and Half Moon Bay suddenly willy-nilly decided to paint their side of the curb red. So um, now all the surfers have no place to get out of their cars but on the left-hand side of the, well, I should say the east side of Highway 1, and same with beachgoers. So it's not just surfers that are walking across the road with their surfboards. It's also um, beachgoers, families, people toting all their beach gear and their coolers and beach chairs and kids. So personally, I don't think it's safe at all, no matter where you put it, because there's still going to be jaywalkers. So I would hope that they would build a, or at least can, research doing a underpass or even an overpass, but I think an underpass would be more useful from the Burnham Park straight into Surfers Beach parking lot over there where the mobile homes are, which I think is Harbor District property. That's just all I wanted to say on that. I do have other questions, but they're not regarding this. So I'll take three minutes later on other issues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sabrina. Yeah, thank you. Um, so <clears throat> I just wanted to mention that um, I find this presentation very confusing. I wish that we had a slide deck tonight that was um, specifically related to the letter because there is a lot of information around the um, draft Caltrans negative declaration um, and the letter that you guys have proposed, which is, um, let's just say very um, min minimal in content and um, could really do with a lot of work. Um, so I had hoped that we would be uh, going through a uh, point by point um, PowerPoint deck this evening, um, giving an overview of what uh, you guys have been asked to weigh in on related to the NEG deck and what's going to be coming to the Planning Commission, apparently at their next meeting. And so just for the public's information, I'm talking about the sure. Caltrans 
state route one so highway one traffic operational systems improvement project there's so much like, to in that there? project i really would appreciate it if we could focus most of the time on that thank you okay we we said we're not doing we're doing that in order we're here so when we get to your item then you can talk further and we do have another slide on that issue to your to her point uh, are there any members of the council that want to comment? I'm going to close the public comment part of this uh, part of your agenda. Are there any council members that want to say anything about the surfers beach issues before you guys move on? Yes, I do. Go ahead. Okay, so I, I sent um, I sent an image to uh, the MCC just a moment ago. Um, which is an image of an example idea, um, possible alternative. Um, and I'd like to see if you could uh, uh, post, post uh, get that up on the screen so that everybody knows what I'm talking about. Is this an image of the overpass that you showed us last no. time? I think it might be easier for you to just say what you have to say because it's going to be really kind of difficult to put that up on the screen. Well, okay, well, hold on. I'm willing to try. I'm willing to try. Just give me a second here. I'll, I'll start. Um, yeah. Is that it? Oh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. So um, <clears throat> this is an idea. Uh, I think there's a number of uh, ways to call it a um, a, a I think probably the best way to call it would be a two-stage offset crossing, which would prevent anyone from cross taking across both lanes in one shot. And anybody that has crossed or anybody that's been driving and uh, has to stop for a pedestrian to cross, you understand that... Uh, you know, it, it would be a lot easier if you if you you would you would have much better ability to um, know how much to break and how long you would have to stop for if you were certain that this uh, pedestrian was just going to cross. You know, just the one lane. Um, it would be safer, um, and it wouldn't necessarily be so drastic. Uh, Len touched earlier, it sounds like his idea is possibly uh, mimicking the uh, Moss Beach crossing, have, have, a, have a, a light there, um, which I would be 100% against because that would just, um, would just destroy uh, traffic. Uh, backups would be horrible. This would be a, a simple um, solution around it. And uh, it would make it much safer if a pedestrian only had to cross one lane at a time. They could, um, you know, they could wait there for a moment until someone, you know, clearly gives them a signal that they're stopping, or uh, wait for just a natural um, break in traffic and then make that crossing without impacting the traffic. So um, I just wanted to throw this up there. This is what I would suggest. In fact, um, through the uh, safety mobility study that lasted from what was it 2010 to let's say 2017 um, the result was a crossing of this nature in Moss Beach this is the this is the type of crossing that the community chose but for some reason it was forgotten about I remember it was posted on the MCC website um, for for amount of time. I don't know if it's still there, um, but anyway. So this is um, worth uh, having a community discussion over, uh, mainly because of the minimal impact on traffic flow and uh, increased safety. Thanks, Dan. Michelle. Hi. Yes. Um so in theory, I am definitely in support of a crossing at Surface Beach. Um, you know, I think it's the current system where people are just walking across the street, uh, you know, at any, you never know when someone's going to step out really from a parked car or between two cars. Um, that's very 
very much slowing down the traffic, especially on the weekends. I mean, pretty much almost every single weekend, it's um, completely backed up there. And I think a lot of the locals go through El Granada uh, instead to, to get around it. Um, however, I do sort of question whether, it, you know, the, a couple slides back or maybe one forward, it said surfers won't hike. And I, I wonder if having a crossing at one additional point along that, that stretch of road is going, if her servers are going to hike to that, or if they're still, you know, going to get out of their cars and just run across where they are. I think, so I think that, that this is a great idea, but it, it can't just stand alone. We would have to have additional enforcement um, that, to, to make sure that people are in fact crossing at the crossing. And one of the problems with the Moss Beach crossing is that obviously it was put in without any local um, consult, consultation or anything like that, but there's no enforcement. I always am seeing people just, you know, or I've even tried crossing myself and people don't slow down and there's no enforcement, even when the light is on now. And thankfully we have the rapid rectangular flashing beacon and that definitely helps, but there's still people who will not um, stop for that. And they think it's an optional thing. So I would just say, yes, and before this, as long as we were able to work with local law enforcement to ensure that people are in fact using the crossing and not just still running across the street. Greg, I'm gonna turn order. it back over to you. Uh, excuse me, point of order that, um, the, or I'm sorry, point of information. Um, it has been discussed in the past by the CHP that it is legal to cross the way people are crossing now. Mm -hmm. It's okay, actually so legal it is, at given intersections, or maybe you know this answer uh, too. It is totally legal mm -hmm. across anywhere along that stretch. CHP and sheriff have confirmed it multiple times. You're not allowed to just step out in traffic, but you are allowed to cross at any point. So I was just, the, the reason I There's, raised my hand was to make Dan's point and add, as I said during the other discussions, if you want to require people to use that crosswalk, you have to then pass an ordinance to not allow crossing at any point except the crosswalk for it to be enforceable, which is doable, but not easy. Greg, I'm gonna- I would want to double back. check that because I believe that the rule is if there is not a, an existing crosswalk within a certain number of feet. So maybe in existence right now, the way it is, people can cross, but if we put a crosswalk there, there may be a, certain number of feet where it has to be where within that people aren't allowed to cross. You can't just cross right next to an existing crossing. We're well, opening up the, uh, you know, the example at Sam's chowder house. I mean, how, where, where does it, where does it end? Good point. Greg, I'm going to put this, give this back to you. You can pr proceed or. I, I want to be sure. Questions. Okay. I just want to be sure we've heard from Dave. I know we've heard from uh, Dan and Michelle of the council. Um, did you have a comment, Claire, to make on this issue? My main comment is the same as Michelle's, that, that this is a complex situation and, and one group by itself is not going to solve it. But that's why we're talking about it. Len, did you want to add something to this? Not at this point. Okay, the only point I wanted to make, and I think there's some good ideas here, it's a very narrow stretch of road. And, and of course, it's very shallow in terms of sea level. So I'm not clear we can do an underpass. I think an overpass would probably get uh, objections in terms of blocking the views. Dan's concept makes sense. But right now, if we're going to add a multimodal trail and a bike trail, we're not going to have enough width. So that raises the possibility. And I think Barbara mentioned this. I'm glad to hear her thinking about this. We might want to run the bike trail, the multimodal trail, further up to the east along where Burnham Park is going to be and keep that bike traffic off of this narrow stretch of Highway 1. Maybe that would give enough width for something like what Dan is envisioning. I don't know. But I just wanted to point out that there is that congestion conflict there. Um, okay, so that, that's all I think we need to discuss about this. Um, can, I, uh, not, can I add just one quick, not, more, one more quick comment? So um, in wherever you cross a highway or any busy street, um, as Dave touched, you know, you can't just jump right in front of a car. So there's a, um, a moving car there. 
there's kind of a little bit of a gray area and everybody's got a different um idea of 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 you know who is there first and who needs to stop and um <clears throat> but you know body language uh is critically important and it should be you know this should be like an education i don't know maybe so, i hate signs but uh, uh but you know how many times have we all seen somebody standing at the edge of the road and they're looking up and they're looking down you think they're crossing but they're just standing there and so you know you you, you know you tend to some people tend to break but um you know there should be more rules uh you know if somebody is standing at the edge of the road giving a clear signal that they intend to cross and they're waiting to cross then you know if if somebody in a car sees that well they should um you know if it's safe they sh they should make that moment in time to to break for them and and let them cross um the other thing is you know if if uh we try to funnel every pedestrian across in only one spot. Then now you have a situation where you've got a whole queue of people crossing, and, and that's just going to stop the traffic on Highway 1 even longer if you, if you um, focus everybody to cross only in one um, uh, location. So that is just something to think about. Thank you. Okay, so I'm ready to move on to the next slide. Lynn, I think we put this in here, but you may have already spoken to these points. Um, other updates? You're talking about the other, well, we have uh, talked about the multi-asset roadway. Uh, Lena has basically told us that Gray Whale Cove is not going anywhere the rest of this year. Uh, the multimodal trail, we've, we've touched on the same way. And then we have the uh, project going on in Moss Beach. And again, that's that's one that will not get underway till midsummer, and will it's both a technical project from Caltrans standpoint, but it will raise the question of the intersections and the highway in between in Moss Beach. So that means that we can uh, at this point could drop down into the MCC letter, unless okay. there are any other clarifications. No, I, I think we're good to go to, on to the letter. We have now just under an hour to discuss this. Can I ask one quick question? Because I thought we were only talking about the crosswalk before. On your um, thing, Greg, you mentioned the um, barrier project. Is that to prevent cars from going over the side? Is that what that's called? Or is it what some other called. project? That, that's what? what it's called. But is it yes. up there? where they're all going over on Highway 1 near the tunnel? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, there's a long history uh, going back to September of 2020 about the project, um, which was called the Help Me Out When Highway 1 Traffic Systems Operational Improvement Project. Mm -hmm. um, and... In the course of reviewing that, there was a lot of opposition generated both amongst us and among the people in Half Moon Bay that there were too many signs, they were in the wrong places, so they amended it and cut back. But what is in front of the Planning Commission now still does include variable message signs. It also includes something called wireless detection systems, which is to gather traffic statistics and information. Um, and the planning commission is due to hear this on May 25th. So we drafted a letter uh, and we were not in unanimous agreement among the three of us that participated in this. We drafted a letter which is on the website and if I'm lucky, maybe I can find it and bring it up here to share. Okay, and the letter says that we would like the 
Planning Commission to drop approval for the VMS from that project. We oppose any use of VMS in our area. These signs do not fit the rural character of our area and consume a large roadway footprint. So that was point one of the letter. Point two, we believe that the technology proposed for traffic monitoring will be useful. In particular, I'm aware of traffic studies that are being used to justify projects that are based on 2014 traffic data or based on a day here and a day there. My hope is that with this wireless detection system, we will get continuous traffic monitoring in a database we can mine to make more intelligent decisions about the level and density of development here on the coast. So there's a paragraph in here that says, we continue to support the technology proposed for traffic monitoring with the expectation that it will lead to shareable current traffic data to be used in transportation planning mid-coast, a reduction in the footprint for the Caltrans equipment, and the introduction of broadband capability, as was mentioned in a recent Caltrans presentation. That was a meeting Len and I attended, oh, about a month ago. Um, but since we drafted this, uh, we got some feedback from both uh, Dan Haggerty, who can speak to this, and from I heard from a couple of other residents that they are concerned about capturing personally identifiable information and the use of cell phone data. Um, I did not have such concerns because uh, my understanding is our cell phone data is already being captured by Google Maps and Ways. So to me, it was no big deal. And there is a statement in the NAG deck that they're not going to capture personally identifiable information. They're going to anonymize it. But I think people don't trust the process. So um, that is what's in the letter now. What Dan had proposed was dropping this paragraph here about we continue to support the technology. So Dan, do you want to speak to your objections? Oh, uh, yes. Thank you. So um, first of all, I, I got to say that um, with so many projects going on, uh, there's there's just been a lot of confusion within the community. Um, I'm looking at a fact sheet right now, Caltrans, um, and they even on this fact sheet, they've mixed up projects. So um, it's just been a history of confusion. Um, now, I think um, not enough information has been shared regarding the, the cell phone data capture um, or the wireless detection system options um, or, or the overall plan for, I guess they're calling it now, they're calling it so many different things, but they're, they're using smart corridor uh, concept. Um, I, I want to say that uh, I did a little research and uh, there's a Berkeley study from June, 2020. Um, this, uh, they studied four Caltrans, and the report says that the existing inductive loop uh, detection systems and, and their, um, their saw cut into the pavement, that's an inductive loop that's in the ground. So every time a car drives over it, the controller, the traffic controllers detect that, and they count a car. Um, and this is how, you know, you get the, you know, how many minutes it takes to get from... Uh, to the airport, on and on. Um, so the, they clearly say that the um, clearly outlined that the existing inductive loop detection system are considered to be the most efficient way to collect traffic data. Now, this is a uh, a consultant that Caltrans paid that is saying this. Um, they also go in and they wrote uh, quite a bit about. Um, the use of commercial big data sources of uh, traffic data. Um, I think that they're, you know, referring to um, the cell phone capture. I also want to, um, in the neg deck, I think Jill's grants, one of Jill's, Jill Grant's comments was responded and essentially Caltrans responded and said, well, we don't, this wireless detection system, we don't know which system we're going to use. It won't be identified until the design phase. Well, if we tell them that, oh, go ahead um, now, and Caltrans, we trust you. 
no matter which vendor you pick, that the, and the community will at that time have no opportunity to really inspect um, whoever's holding and capturing this uh, this data from cell phones. Um, and you know, what would it take? What about hackers that that can you know hack in? Um, so on and so on. There's all. There's a whole list of unanswered questions um, that the community is asking uh, about. And, um, you know, frankly, this May 25th uh, um, going to the Planning Commission is just far too soon. There is no reason that they should have to decide on this now. We should write a letter saying that they should not decide on it, or they should, if they have to now, to vote no, um, because there was just not enough information for the community at present. Um, now, I want to emphasize that the whole community, as defined by uh, the MCC bylaws, should be part of this discussion uh, with a robust participation. Um, everyone on the coast side will be affected by this decision. Um, and, you know, um, I also just. Uh, yeah, I think I think we have to let time for other people to speak. No, no, for a while. One, last, one last quick quick comment is that I was up. I was, it was six months ago. I was up in Pacifica, and there was this large cell phone temporary antenna van that was there. I went out talked to the people. They were uh, a subcontractor for AT and T. Uh, doing data capture testing. So if you can all look into it, there's. Um, there's a history of it. It seems like that's the direction they're going, and they're saying that it's all anonymous. Don't worry about it. Just trust us. Um, but we need to have time to inspect um, actually what's really going on so that the community understands. Okay. Um, Claire, what's the proper protocol here? Should I open it up for the rest of the council first or for the for the public? You should open for the what council. Usually, what we usually do is uh, clarifying questions from the council followed by All right. uh, comments from the public, followed by comments from the council. Okay, so do we have uh, clarifying questions from the rest of the council besides Dan? That would be me. Michelle and Len are both raising their hands. Um, Michelle, we have two it, I think. Yeah, so I, I may have missed it, but I didn't see anywhere in the presentation where you covered the letter that we wrote in October of 2020 on this project and uh, you know just not sure if you're even aware that we commented we are actually made an official comment on this project back then um, we made two comments they're posted on the agenda on the website okay. yes we made two prior letters okay um all right that was my question both of those letters were passed I think that, well, the second one was passed so no, on November 18th. Um, I'd like to answer a couple of points that Dan raised. Um, if you look at the overall thrust of the project, um, they're trying to basically have more intelligence able to monitor and in some cases be proactive with the flow of traffic. Uh, that's always been something Dan's been supportive of, so I'm a little surprised. Uh, of his concern, or at least not to mention, those are the possibilities that are there. Uh, in terms of the tracking of traffic, the induction loop is basically a car counter. It counts cars as they go by. It doesn't give you any sense of how long it takes a car to go from one place to another place. Now, where does that data exist? It exists in all of the, the uh, navigation maps sources who basically track individual cars by their cell phone, who identify themselves and can tell you how long it's gonna take to get from this point to that point today or you know, for the current traffic. Uh, that the induction loops don't do that. And those are the big data sources. So when we were working last in the, the previous year, I looked at that and those sources are there, but they collect them and process the data and charge a lot of money for it. Uh, what Caltrans is trying to build is a system that could generate that on a regular basis. So I think it's, it's a good starting point. I found that in listening to their presentations over the last year and a half, 
that they de-emphasized, or in the case of one of our projects, moved completely away from the variable message signs and emphasized it more from the standpoint of information and technology supporting monitoring the traffic. And I think that's consistent with comments, certainly that I made back when we passed the letters uh, last year. So I, I think that this isn't being sprung on people what it is, is there's two heads to it. Uh, variable message signs were by and large unpopular to uh, for most people completely. Uh, for ourselves, we said if there were message signs that would help us in the case of an emergency, uh, that we would be supportive. That's one of the reasons we came back and provided a, a positive vote there. But really, I felt from my end, it was really the technology they were trying to build and they're just in the starting phases here. So that's why I support the second paragraph. And in terms of what Dan is saying, that this was brought to meetings. It's just that at, at a year ago, we were listening harder to the variable message signs and not to the rest of the message they were bringing forward. Um, so that's what I say. In terms of the, uh, the sentiments that have been brought forward, <clears throat> I think, you know, so we, we prepared this letter with respect to the variable message signs. I, I, I recognize there's a sentiment for people wanting more consideration and to go in a different tack there. Uh, we, we really aren't going to be able to respond to that in today's meeting. We can certainly either modify this letter or vote this letter down but to bring forward something that expressed a different opinion would require, well, in this case, we would have to have a special meeting to get back to it before the 25th. But I think many of the people are speaking are quite articulate on this point, and certainly the Planning Commission is there to receive their comments. So I would recommend they do that for sure, uh, because that's, that's, they have, the planners are looking at that right now to come out with their report. And although they're into the process, it's not too late to get those letters into them and even to plan to come to that meeting. Greg, could I address some of the things that- uh, Well, you had your turn. I want to make sure there's no other I, clarifying I mean, questions I'll, from other I, council I, members. So Dave, do you have any clarification that you wish to ask or- Not, not clarification, I have comments. Okay, he has comments. Michelle, you've asked a clarifying question. A lot Claire, of questions you, so far. Do you have any clarifying questions? No, I don't. Okay, so that's the clarifying questions. And then per the protocol you're suggesting, uh, we sorry. now add, oh, Jill, do you have, there you are. Yeah, I do. Um, I do have a clarifying question um, about the technology proposed. So, so this letter is saying we do not want any of the VMS signage at all, but we want Correct. the technology for traffic monitoring but we're not uh, sure where it will be kept and what will be um, collected. And then we were talking about ways and how you can already track people from their phones, but you can turn your location off and you cannot have Google Maps or Waze on your phone. So, so as I understand it, you're not being tracked if you don't have those apps on your phone and you have your location off. Is that true, or am I wrong? As well. Yes, that's true. I can't hear you, Dave. Sorry. You have to turn off Bluetooth as well, and you have to turn off your cell phone itself because cell phone towers have to know where you are. His point being, you can triangul triangulate the location of a cell phone from the cell towers, so it's not enough to just turn off your location. You have to turn off the phone. Okay. But to your point, Jill, it is true. I had Scott Boyd look into this document and he made several comments as well. They are not yet specific about the technology and the nature of the data storage and the ability and, and ways in which they would share it. There's a comment in the NAG deck that during the design phase, they'll decide on the technology. And what we don't know is what ability we will have to comment during that design phase and influence any of the other granular details of the monitoring program. Okay, thank you. So um, I wanna be clear that I- So now it's time to ask the public, and I know Sabrina has made a comment, 
what uh, the Greg, public please, comments let me, are, right? Let me uh, respond to... Uh, uh, Dan, we have a protocol here I'm following. You've spoken. Oh, this is within the protocol. Speak. You're going to get to speak again during right. the comment period. I want to know what the public has to say at this point in time. Okay. So, Sabrina, did you wish to amplify what you put in the chat? Is there anybody else from the public who wishes to speak? Steve, instead, have their hands up. I can't see them. I'm, I'm happy to speak or wait until Steve, other speakers speak. Steve Terry is at the top of the list. Somebody Greg? call on us. Greg? Go ahead, Steve. Steve. Steve Terry. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, thank you. Um, I do want to comment. I, I, one quick comment on the VMS. I support what you're saying later here about uh, getting rid of the VMS. But the main comment I want to talk about is the WDS. Can you please pull up the TOS document, page 184, Greg, if you, were, if you would, wouldn't mind? I don't know if I can do that quickly. I will try. That's where it talks about what the um, Caltrans is proposing to do, and it says. So, uh, Greg? Yeah. I, uh, is this uh, 184, the, the page number, or 184, the sheet number, if you will? Anyway, uh, if you'll let me show my screen, the page I number. bring it up. The page number 6.4. It's question, response to question 6, 6.4. Bottom of page 180, printed page, printed 184. Okay. Uh, annotated, Dave, annotated Dave will have to make you co-host. I can't. I'm a co-host. You just need to stop sharing. I've stopped sharing. Okay, good enough. I'm going to go here. And we're going to go to this one here, I believe. Okay, is uh, I think this is it, Terry. Yeah, scroll to the bottom there, and scroll the bottom, and, and so you get the top of 185 as well. Okay. So what what you see there is it says the the last sentence, the half of that last sentence there, it says. Traffic data collected through WDS may be obtained through a number of readily available commercial FCC approved technologies. So they, they list radar, Bluetooth, thermal, acoustics, Wi-Fi, and DSRC. Now, the, the things that the, the the three of these six that bother me are the ones that are tracking you, are that are connecting with your devices. So Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, obviously, presumably those are no, 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 no. Go back. Yeah, you're, you were good. Right, right there is good. Right there is good. So at the bottom 184, top of 185 was where I just read. And Bluetooth, to, in order to use Bluetooth or Wi-Fi at all, they have to connect to your phone, or it doesn't make any sense. And so for sure, you've got personal identifiers. Yeah, they, just, they just look at the MAC addresses. So, yeah, if we, if we trust them, right? I mean, to, 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 sort, of, to sort of adapt a Michael, a Michael Parenti phrase, I mean, as far as Caltrans' model with data is, we have a lot of data. We want we we can get more data. We want all the data. I mean, that's that's kind of the way Caltrans is, and uh, there's no reason you need Bluetooth or Wi-Fi to 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 do what you're doing. You've got three other technologies there that work just fine. And someone mentioned earlier about trying to get the speed of traffic or something like that. You need to see, oh, Wi-Fi at this point and Wi-Fi at that point. You don't need that because you have you have the acoustic stuff here. You can do Doppler with the acoustic to get speed. You can find out the speed at any point. And the speed you can extrapolate to get to get time to get somewhere. They're not and, looking for speed at a point. They're looking for speed over a distance, time over a distance. Well, you can extrapolate speed at a point and average that over a distance to, to get a rough idea. A it's not going to be exact, but on the coast, we don't need point-to-point uh, -point speed. We don't need to know how long it took from to get from Montana to to Half Moon Bay. We don't need that. Uh, we do. the, the big concern is getting over the hill or something, getting over in the Pacific or, not, or into over, over 92. So, so Steve, the other- Steve, I have to let, I have to let others speak here too. Um, the, the guts of your comment is you, you would like to remove the paragraph that supports the wireless detection system. Is that what I'm hearing? And the DSRC. The DSRC is essentially trying to, is reading your uh, fast track transponder. That's what that one is. They want All to right, read your so fast track transponder. One approach to doing that is to delete the second paragraph of the letter. Uh, I see Carlisle Ann Young has her hand raised. Yes, I, I really was interested in what Steve Terry was talking about, but all the MCC council members kept interrupting him. Um, I 
do not support them tracking me, but I do have a transponder for toll tags, so I assume they are. And um, I've seen like at 92 and ugh, right where the reservoir is, I've seen little antennas up on the power poles. Is that what we're talking about? Or are they little things that are embedded in the roadway? I've seen those also. I, no, these I, are I antennas hanging the off the poles. It's a little yaggy antenna, so it's a short antenna with little little bars across it hanging from the yes. street, street signs typically. And that is that is what they're talking about for this uh, WDS system? That's Presumably what they the say. The name, yeah, you'll be mounted on existing street lights and poles. Yes. Okay. So I guess I wouldn't mind that, but I since they haven't really specified who the ultimate supplier is or how it's going to be tracking it, I'm not happy with that. And I also didn't understand what the that second paragraph said when it says introduction to broadband capability. Could you explain that, Greg? I can In the try. MCC letter. Yeah, I can try. There was a presentation given, um, Lynn, I can't remember the date, but uh, it was over a month ago. And they showed a future evolution of the Highway 1 Caltrans work they're doing, including installing broadband. And I want to know more about that. I think it would be beneficial for our coastside community if we had an alternative additional broadband supplier, but I can't tell you anything more than that they put it on a slide that I think said 2026. But it could be some, um, like a Verizon or whoever, Xfinity, I don't know. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. That, that would be my hope, but I can't tell you definitively. I don't think um, we should send a letter of support if we don't even know what we're supporting. That's all I'd like to say. And as far as getting rid of those ugly digital signs, I'm definitely in support of not promoting those. Thank you. Okay, Sabrina Brennan had uh, made comments in the chat and her hand is raised, Sabrina. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you, I'm Sabrina Brennan. Please consider sending a letter to the County Planning Commission asking them for one thing only. Ask the County Planning Commission to continue consideration of the Route 1 Traffic Operational Systems Improvement Project until after the City of Half Moon Bay Planning Commission considers the project. We are one co-side and we share Highway 1. It's a scenic corridor. So we need to hear from the City of Half Moon Bay. The proposed signage is not needed. The signage is not in optimal locations to reduce gridlock and calm traffic. The signage does not reduce carbon emissions and it does not improve public safety. Please use, use state funding for projects that we actually need. Better locations for digital signage include east of Crystal Springs Reservoir near 280 and 92, and another location that would be beneficial would be Highway 1 at Sharp Park. This would allow time to adequately warn drivers that the coast side is experiencing gridlock so they can make alternative plans and reduce greenhouse emissions. Not enough info has been provided about the device data collection. Detailed info about the tech should have been provided prior to consideration. The lack of information included in the State Route 1 Traffic Operational Systems Improvements Project study a negative declaration is another reason to ask the County Planning Commission to continue the item until after the City of Half Moon Bay Planning Commission considers the proposed project. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. Claire, I saw your hand was raised, but I thought we were taking the public first. This is public. Uh, I was okay. going to read, I had a um, statement that I was asked to read by a member of the public who I think just put his statement in chat. Um, but I will go ahead and read it as, as brief. This is from Kevin Lansing, who is uh, apparently a member of, a former chair of the Heffern Bay Planning Commission. It says, I support the proposed draft letter to remove the use of VMS along Highway 1 corridor in the mid coast in Half Moon Bay. These ugly and unnecessary signs would significantly, significantly degrade the scenic and visual qualities of Highway 1 corridor in violation of the California Coastal Act Section 30251, which states 
The scenic and visual qualities of coastal areas shall be considered and protected as a resource of public importance. Permitted development shall be cited and designed to protect views to and along the ocean and scenic coastal areas to minimize the alteration of nat natural landforms and to be visual compa visually compatible with the character of surrounding areas and where feasible to restore and enhance visual quality in visually degraded areas. The proposed VMS signs would do precisely the opposite of what is mandated by the Coastal Act. Thank you, Claire. Mm -hmm. Harvey? Um, uh, about a year ago, the Half Moon Bay City Council unanimously uh, uh, voted to oppose the VMS signs. So the City Council has jurisdiction beyond the Planning Commission, and it's very clear that uh, the City Council does not want the VMS signs uh, anywhere where in, in the city limits. So that's in, in, in reaction to what Sabrina said. We, we don't need any further action. We are clear that uh, the City Council opposes those signs. Thank you. Thank you, Harvey. So I don't see any further public comment, and now we should go around and hear what the council wants to do. And if you don't mind, oh, wait a minute. I will hear from Dave in a minute. I just wanted to try and synthesize what I've heard from the discussion. One option is to adopt the letter as written. Another option, if we can't agree on the support for wireless detection and traffic monitoring, would be what Dan proposed and just remove that second paragraph. And then a third option would be something else that you all might want to suggest. So, uh, Dave, you have your hand up. Yeah, uh, so my comments are three. One, I would drop the whole bit about location and monitoring simply because we've already said that before and it's not, uh, it's not, it's clearly not a consensus. I don't think it adds anything to the letter. Um, I will also point out that the last time around, I was one of the people who wanted us to not approve the VMS signs at all. That is to be like the city council. Um, and uh, uh, argued down on the basis that people were concerned about emergency evacuation. So nobody today has said anything about emergency evacuation. So even though I disagreed with that rationale, I want to mention it just so it doesn't go unremarked. And uh, one technical thing on the letter, uh, it ought to be addressed to uh, whoever the appropriate feedback person is at ends as well. That's it. Okay. We, you, you may want to get a um, motion to get the letter on the table for discussion. Uh, I had thought we should hear from people first and then we could make the motion without having a motion and then an amendment. What do you think? Yeah, so that's, we can go either way. Technically, you're supposed to have a motion on the floor before. The well, we'll put a motion on the floor, but I, I want to get a sense as a council. If, if people are in favor of removing that second paragraph, then that should be the motion we make. The, how, about, the how about just going around the council and seeing if everybody wants to get rid of that paragraph and then we can have that done? Okay, so dropping the second paragraph, Dave? Yes. Dan? Yes. Claire? Yes. Jill? Yes, can you put the letter up? It's up. I will. No. Oh, it's not. I had it up. Len, could you bring it up? Um, Len, I didn't hear what he said. I, I think he's bringing you, up your letter. Do you want to drop? Are you in agreement with dropping the second paragraph, Len? Oh. No. Michelle? Uh, I have comments on the letter in general, but I could drop the second paragraph. Okay. So uh, what I hear is a majority of the council already, without me even voting, is in favor of dropping that second paragraph. So I think the motion we should make is to drop the second paragraph and approve the letter Otherwise. Well, we have to make a motion to put the letter on the table first, right? So I, exactly. I've made the motion. I will make the motion, and then I'll make the amendment if people are okay with that. So I'm, 
I move that we adopt the letter. We need a second. Second. Okay, and then I propose an amendment to drop the second paragraph section about uh, location of monitoring and to add the Caltrans uh, feedback address. Second. You were second on both, right? Sir? Yeah. So if so, Greg, uh, if we're going to discuss what's on the table now, you probably want to get the comments from the um, community and then close that and then go to the council and then vote. Okay. So what, what I'm hearing is we're going to remove this paragraph that I'm highlighting. Can you see my screen? No. But you're not sharing. Uh, it's not working. Len, can you do it? I'll, I'll go find it. Try stopping and resharing, Greg. Yeah, I, I thought I did. <laughs> okay. So. I guess we can't um, ask them to put it up further north up in like Crystal Springs, that area near 92, right? That's not part of this whole debate. Correct. No. Okay, so we have a motion and an amendment. And Claire, you're saying we should ask for community comment on the amended letter. Yes, uh, yes. Okay. Um, relatively brief community comment, and there are two people with their hands up at the moment. Can you see them? I see Sabrina. Yeah, go ahead. And JQ Oswine. Sabrina? She dropped her hand. I think she made her comment. Yeah, I'm here. JQ. I haven't made my comment. Um, so are we looking at the edited letter? What are we looking at here? Because I'd like to see the letter with the edit, so I understand what's what you guys are proposing. No, we we try not to edit live. It's just too difficult. And this is an easy edit dropping the second paragraph. So all you're doing is taking out the second paragraph. And adding a recipient. Okay. Um, so it's my understanding that what is happening at the, at the planning commission is they are going to be considering a CDP. Am I correct in understanding that? That's correct. Okay. So I don't see anything in here about the CDP. This doesn't seem to be specific about CEQA or the CDP, which is what the planning commission is. That's going to be the limit of what they can really tackle, right? I can't this, speak to what the planning commission's procedure is. Shouldn't this letter be going to the planning commission? It is. We go to oh, no, it's going to Schaller. Can it, we were can asked it, to comment to Schaller. Can you please send the letter to the Planning Commission, the people that we look to to make decisions? Because they're the ones that need to hear from the community, and you guys are supposed to be representing the community to the Planning Commission. We, we can also send it to the planner as well. Sure, you could copy the planner. So I right. would just, so I would, add. I would, I'd ask that you guys please think about the considerations of planning commissioners. They're going to be looking at this as a CDP and look, working within the confines of the Coastal Act. Um, so I think that those are, those are the types of, uh, that's the lens you should be looking through when you think about the content that should be included here. And I think the points that were made about the fact that these signs don't do anything to reduce carbon emissions, they don't improve public safety, um, they're actual real things that could do that, 
but none of it is included in this project. Those are the kinds of things that might be beneficial for the planning commission to understand. It's just a suggestion. Thank you. Greg, the, for, so just so, so you know, the people who have their hands up now are JQ, Sid, and Steve, and I would suggest that you uh, uh, close public comment after those people. It's up to you. Okay, so JQ. Uh, yeah, I, I like your um, your comment about supporting the introduction of broadband, and I was wondering if we could leave just that part in that second paragraph. Thank you. Okay, I see Sid Young is next. I'm not really sure what broadband they're talking about, so I'm a little worried about writing them a blank check, but um, I already sent my comment into the Planning Commission about the ugliness of those VMS signs, so hopefully they're not going to consider that, but the... Um, <clears throat> Question, I thought I heard Michelle Weil say she had a comment about the wording on the letter. So I never, you guys didn't really get back to her on that. Um, if there was nothing she had to say, then I don't really have anything else to say, but it seemed like she got cut off. So thanks. I was just waiting for for the council discussion on the letter. This is not comment coming up. Okay. No. This is Steve Terry, is the last public commenter. I, I would just like to say, I would, I would urge you, I, I ask you to add a second paragraph, which says something along the lines of, in choosing, w, in choosing WDS devices, please remove devices that connect to personal devices and restrict, restrict your selections to some combination of acoustic, radar, and thermal. I can type that in the chat if you That's want. That's good. Okay, thank you, Steve. I see Lisa has a public comment. Lisa Ketchum. Yes, sorry, I'm trying to unmute myself. Um, I, I don't want to speak to your decision here. I wanted to fill in from the perspective of, of any time the Planning Commission is asked to make a decision that there are constraints that you folks don't have, and, and I want you to be aware of that process. For example, when we reviewed the off-leash dog program and we tried to modify the project and just approve part of it, we were told we could not. It had to be yes or no. And then other times, um, for example, the propane yard that we heard uh, two weeks ago, we were able to, with careful wording, say, well, we approve the project with the following modifications. But in order to do something complex like that, where you need the final wording for these modifications, it required somebody on the commission to have figured all out what they would like to have and have it written up to show so it could be captured. And I'm not aware of uh, anyone qualified to do that. Or I mean, the planning commission hadn't heard anything about this project. So it's it's not just a matter of you know where you could decide here now, how would you like this outcome to be? Keep this change that and you get and you get into the technicalities it, the planning commission isn't set up to do that in my experience i've been always learning new things but basically there will be a staff report which will either recommend approval or denial and usually it's approval and they will have your letter and they will uh brush it aside or they will say or whatever they do you know basically the the commissioners are, they have this input from the staff report and they have, it usually it includes a uh, mention of an MCC letter or the Coastal Commission comments, but, um, it, and it's, it's also very important for people to um, comment at the meeting. If you hope to sway them against the staff report, uh, that makes a big difference and the different perspectives from the community to hear that. And, and as well, I would also recommend the comments he heard today, for example, Claire read a written comment uh, to, to save those and uh, either post it with the stuff on the website or somehow get that information to the planning commissioners. It, it, that sort of thing always helps with a decision, especially of a complex type of thing like this. 
Uh, and then also the idea of continuing an item, you know, the planning commissioners could decide, well, continue this and come back with certain changes, you know, but it's, it's, we are constricted and how, just wanted to let you know that, that's all, thanks. Lisa, could you Excellent. put the Planning Commission email address in the chat, please, so members of the public can send in their comments? Sure. Okay, so that is the last public comment. Um, just for point of information, I have the email from Schaller to us up here, and he didn't ask us any kind of pro forma question about the CDP or whatever. What he asked was, have either of your agency's positions changed on this project? Do you have the same concerns as was voiced at that time? So I apologize if I missed the technicality, but we were writing back to tell him that we are changing our position on the VMS and that we are uh, completely opposed to those, okay? So I believe what we have on the table is a letter without that second paragraph. And the letter's the not effective, one... Greg. No. No, please, Greg's in charge right now. I'd like to make a motion so to amend the letter. We have, we have, don't we have a motion on the table and seconded for yeah, the amended we letter? Do. Okay, okay. We, we need to, so I think if we can take as many amendments as it could, and then we write on the amendments one by one unless somebody withdraws them. I, I did want okay. to ask a question, and if that's okay with you, Dan, before you make your amendment. Um, nowhere in the application or Mike's letter does it say anything about a CDP. We have a mitigated neg deck attached. The planning just doesn't say anything about CDP or anything else. Does anybody know for sure that there's a CDP involved here, or is this just a courtesy of sharing it with the planning commission? I know. Thank you. Should I speak? Yes, please. Um, the item on the Planning Commission agenda in two weeks will be a CDP for the project. Yeah. The, the CEQA document, uh, Caltrans is the lead agency, they, they approve their own. <clears throat> That's I, I got another letter from Mike on that as well. He said the same thing. The, um, and basically when the planner asks you these types of questions, it's to inform his staff report. That's, that's his main focus. Um, and that may be adequate for uh, certain things that council wishes to participate on. In addition, they might decide that a certain issue it's important to write to the decision maker. That depends on the issue. Once again, just talking about process here. Thanks. Could I ask Harvey, when does the Happen Bay no. Planning Commission meet? No, Sid, Sid, we, we gotta go to Dan. Okay, um, first of all, I wanted to uh, just quickly respond to some of the things that Len mentioned earlier. Um, I Yes, I absolutely uh, support uh, a, a, a smart uh, traffic control system. It's just that um, I, I don't know what they're, I'm not clear on exactly what they're proposing and I want to be very clear on what they're proposing. And um, <clears throat> Steve already, uh, Steve already uh, um, mentioned that the inductive loops show the speed and speed can be uh, extrapolated to the uh, uh, travel time. And that's what's used today um, when you go to, you know, uh, Google Maps or whatever, and they say there's a red zone, it's, it's, it's traffic slow in this area. That's that's the information they already use. And um, <clears throat> there were several unanswered, uh, from my um, remembrance, several unanswered questions from the uh, uh, virtual meeting on this. Um, uh, on this uh, project. So I, I'd like to go ahead and make a motion to amend the letter uh, based on... Um, state, your, state your amendment. I have it on the chat. You have to state it for the record, Dan. Okay, so we ask that the Planning Commission delays voting to approve the CDP on the Traffic Operations Systems Project 
until time is allowed that a robust, complete coastside community discussion can take place on the wireless detection systems option proposed, or I should have said uh, on the proposed wireless detection systems uh, options. So Dan, if I can ask, is that an addition or is that replacing something? Replacing the second paragraph. Okay. okay. Is, there, is there a second for this amendment? I'll second it. Okay, Jill That's seconds Jill. it? Yes. We need a so we need a vote? Hold on. Now I'm, I'm open for... Um, I don't know if it's out of protocol, but mm -hmm. I'm open to any suggestions on improving this paragraph. Let's start with it. So what we've done is we took out the second paragraph in the original motion. And so in effect, we now have the second paragraph and I'll read it again. We ask that the planning commission delay voting to approve the CDP on the traffic operational systems project until time is allowed that a robust complete out community, coast site community discussion can take place on the wireless detection system options proposed. So yes. we're voting on the amendment only if we're gonna start, start dealing with this. Correct. That is the amendment he's proposed and Jill has right. seconded. Right. We, you've got like you're running a little bit out of time here, so go ahead. Do we have further comment from the council on this amendment? Uh, yeah, we should we should go around. I think include the community as well, please. I don't think they have to do that. They should. I understand. Let's Bring go. Let's go through the council first. I don't see any council members. Uh, maybe I'm not no. missing something. I don't see any council members making comments. Oh, I thought you were going to poll them. Uh, okay, so I think that's a vote, right? No. Well, <clears throat> I, I don't Dan, see the. Uh, I, I don't see the utility in asking people to delay decisions that they already have scheduled. Okay, Len. Len, you wanted to comment. Oh, well, just a comment is I, I think it's going in the right direction um, because really from our, our interactions with Caltrans, especially their reactions on the multi-asset project is when they had individual discussions with us and with Pacifica and with Half Moon Bay, they dropped the multi-asset BMS signs right away. I think their, their, their focus is more on the technology of the project and not the VMS. So I, to me, although most of the speakers have emphasized that, I, I believe it's recognized as, 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 a, as a dead issue or of less importance. So that what Nan is proposing goes in the direction of either rejecting it out of hand, saying we need more information and you know briefing on it because when we've, had briefings from Caltrans about it, they were all about the VMS. And, you know, for example, you know, Terry's, Steve Terry's brought up good points as other people have, and we haven't had those types of questions being brought forward. Sabrina gave an impassioned statement about the VMS, but as I said, I think that's, that's more of a, a dead issue. So I think that we could consider it quite appropriate to follow on the line that Dan's suggesting to, uh, to ask for their consideration. Now that, you know, so you're in favor of him of the paragraph. Yeah, I'm done. He's you know trying to look at it again, but uh, yes, because that's that's Jill? where I, that's where I think we should be at. Jill, what's your sense on the amendment? I am in favor of uh, Dan's amendment, and that's why I seconded it. I also uh, think that Sabrina is right. We should address the letter the letter to the. Uh, planning commission commission and not the planning uh, not a planner but to the actual commission thank you yeah we will we will address the letter to both the planner and the commission and to caltrans I, I, that should be understood dave uh no comments michelle no i i don't really think we should delay something that we've known about for a year and a half 
what we don't know about okay. it. Okay, so Claire? Yeah? You already said you didn't think we should delay a decision that's already scheduled, okay. We so can. I think we're ready to take a vote on this amendment. Uh, you should include, heard from every, should include the council. community. Uh, before you make a decision and vote, you should allow yourself to hear from the community. The only per, uh, uh, it's hard not to jump in. So Brenda does, does have her hand raised. She's the only community in the member, bylaws. Sabrina. It's in the bylaws. Well, I, I, you know, I think um, I appreciate that you guys are directing it to the planning commission. I think that's helpful. Um, I think it was helpful to get clarity on the fact that this is a CDP situation. Um, so I'm glad Lisa was here to chime in on that and a little bit about process. Um, you know, I think that uh, you should make it very clear um, if you guys are willing to that the digital signage portion is something that the community, um, as far as I can tell, unanimously opposes. Um, that there is strong opposition from the community. I think it's really important that that message be delivered to the planning commission. So if you could add a sentence strengthening the point that the digital signage, whatever the proper terminology for that is, I don't know, um, is, is uh, not supported by the community and you might wanna give some specific reasons for that. Um, I think that that's the kind of information that the planning commission needs to help them make a decision because only one out of um, four planning commissioners, because right now we don't have five, we only have four. One out of four lives on the coast side, the other three do not. And they you know, likely um, are not as aware of the traffic issues here as we are. So any information you can provide them to help them be clear on what the community's concerns are would be beneficial. Thank you. So that's it for the community. Uh, I propose we call for a vote. We have two more hands raised. Um, uh, you, 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 you can close public comment if you want, Greg. No, you cannot. Yes, yes you can. can. Kimberly, Williams. Kimberly Williams. Thanks, Greg. I'll be quick. I, I'm just a, a little confused by all this because we, we went through all those meetings previously and, and it sounds like that the VMS signs, as Lynn said, were taken off the table. So I think any letter should just sort of remind, especially if the planning commission is not aware of all of the deliberation and the input that came in prior to this, um, that they should be reminded of that, you know, that all this occurred and this was the input that was received and, and, you know, this is where we ended up. And it sounds like they acted on that partially. So um, I think, you know, whatever you decide here tonight, the, the letter that should go out should sort of reiterate that a little bit to remind them that all of this input did come in because they won't see that necessarily if they're considering a CDP and all this may be new information. And that, that sort of takes it back to square one. And I, I'm, I'm not clear that that's actually the case, but I guess I'm thinking it is, or I'm asking, and maybe that's a question for Lisa. Uh, Carlisle Ann Young. I, I would just like to point out that I really liked what Steve had to say, and hopefully many of the people of the public would send their letters directly to the planning commission so we don't have to wordsmith this one to include everybody's opinions. But um, I think what he said was very important to convey to the planning commission. Thank you. Okay, so I'll close public comment, but Len, is, as a council member, has a comment. Yeah. Oh, Lisa? Just to answer the question on process about the Planning Commission, uh, they they haven't heard anything about this project. It is, it is not on their radar at all. The previous discussions in 2020 were on the CEQA document, and they were directly with Caltrans, just so you know that. Thanks. So... Len? Lisa, I, I have a hypothetical question for you, and if you can't answer it, that's fine. If, if you were to be receiving this CDP request, 
and you heard many opinions that were negative on having the VMS signs and the planning, the planner, basically the county said, we can take that out. We'll just take out all of the uh, visual uh, variable message signs uh, and then let you vote on it. Uh, would you feel you knew what to do? The, uh, as I explained before, and I just want this to be, i uh, use a different example. We, we tried to do that with the, the dog uh, project. Uh, and uh, at that point we were told, if the applicant doesn't voluntarily withdraw that, then we can't change it, you just up or down. And so I don't know if Caltrans would attend this meeting, but um, it's not clear that that would be uh, offered. I'm asking that because the conversations I've had with Caltrans suggest to me they would be willing to do that. So I just want to have, understand that contingency. Yeah, it would it would be hard to know because, like I said, with the propane issue, the uh, the Amerigas person was there, and and they uh, they willingly withdrew their uh, request to have extra tanks stored there. Right. But you ne you never know. That's right. So that's that's where my comment is coming from. Okay, I've made my say, Greg. All right, are we ready uh, to hold a vote of the council on the amended letter? No. No, this is a vote on the amendment. Well, I haven't even commented on the letter yet. No. We're talking oh, about oh, the amendment. Right, sure. This is Greg, a vote on the amendment. Do you want to do this or do you want me to do this? Because we go ahead, do, do it, Claire. You, Claire, you go ahead, do it. Um, go ahead, you get Claire. Your hands full. Okay, we're going to vote on Dan's amendment. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, so the, could you repeat, was that, did uh, Dave uh, and you both move and second on the amendment? Uh, I, yes. What's that? On Dan's amendment, Dan proposed it and Jill seconded it. We have two different I, amendments I on the table, it. right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Take them in reverse. So we're going to do Dan's Dan first. first. Okay. Yes. Okay. So this is a vote on Dan's amendment. I don't think I need to read it again. And it's whether to put it on the letter as amended before us. Okay. Uh, so Claire? No. Greg? No. Dan? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Jill? Yes. Michelle? No. Dave? No. Fails 4-3. Okay. Second, second thing on the uh, table is the uh, original amendment, which was to remove the second paragraph entirely. Um, no, that's that been moved and seconded. So can you call the roll on that one, Len? Okay. Okay, so this is remove the letter in its entirety. Oh, we move the second paragraph. Remove the second paragraph, I'm sorry, the second paragraph of the letter in its entirety. And that that one was made with Dave and your second, Claire? Yes. Okay, for our vote on this, we'll start with Dave. Yes. Michelle? Yes. Jill? Um, can you come back to me? I'm I'm looking at the letter. Sure enough. I'm gonna vote no. Dan? Yes. Greg? Yes. Claire? Yes. Okay, it passes five. Oh, uh, Jill, would you like to vote or abstain? Yes, I vote yes. Okay, it passes six one. So we now have the letter with just the one paragraph and a little closing sentence. Okay. Right, so we're voting on that letter as you just described it, Len. Um, yep. So go ahead. Okay. I'd Here's like to make a comment first. Yeah, we, we should have final comment, I think, at this point, Claire. Okay. Go, go ahead, ahead Michelle. Michelle. Yeah, so uh, I'm definitely concerned about this letter as written. I think there are two main benefits of the VMS signs, those of which we um, talked about a year and a half ago when this project first came forward. Um, one is actually, as, as Sabrina mentioned, the telling visitors 
the traffic and the amount of time it's going to take to get to a specific location. Um, this, this, I know we are just commenting on the signs that are in our area, but this project actually includes VMS signs all the way up to Daly City and down south of Half Moon Bay. And one of the things we talked about originally is that there are a couple signs in the kind of Sharp Park area that could be used to potentially tell people how long it would take to get to certain parts of the coast. And I think that that would actually benefit those of us here on busy weekends when, um, you know, it's going to take an hour, 45 minutes or whatever it is to get from Pacifica into Half Moon Bay or whatnot. Um, so I, I do think that that part of this project is beneficial. And the other thing that I think that these signs, however ugly they may be, could be useful for is emergency um, evacuation. We've talked a lot about what's going to happen on the coast if there is a major event, wildfire, tsunami, um, earthquake, something like that. And if people need to get out or go places um, quickly and a certain road is closed or, you know, there may be, you know, very limited um, law enforcement and fire personnel available to help direct traffic, there's pretty much going to be none for that. Um, you know, people are going to be responding to issues um, that, are, that are arising as a result of whatever emergency it is. And I do think having these signs available just for those purposes could be beneficial. That's what we wrote about in our uh, the second letter that we sent back in November of 2020. And I stand by what we wrote in that. So for that reason, I'm opposed to this letter. Okay. Understand. Any other final comments? Uh, yeah, I, I think M Michelle framed it fairly clearly. Um, and also noting that, that we're part of a, a larger framework for putting the, uh, the signs in. So I'm considering that she made a good point. Okay. I, I, I think Lisa has something she would like to add. I just wanted to add a point of information. The, the CDP that the Planning Commission is considering is only for the portion of the project, in other words, the signs that are in the mid-coast. Uh, Caltrans will need a CDP from Half Moon Bay for anything that's in the city there, and they will also need a CDP from Pacifica for any signs that are there. So you're only considering the signs that they propose for the mid-coast. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That, that helps. Um, Okay, uh, I think we're ready to vote. Um, uh, Jill discuss, wants to, excuse me? I'd, I'd like to just add something just uh, for discussion. Okay, you go ahead and then, then Jill. <clears throat> so um, tonight, okay, my amendment was voted down, um, but tonight uh, the council heard from the community that has concerns in regards to you know, uh, the privacy, the cell phone capture, and, and uh, the lack of clear information as to how Caltrans is going to move forward with this. And so I'm going to urge another council member to, you know, if you have something else, I think that uh, if we just let this go, um, <clears throat> letter as it is, uh, the Planning Commission will likely approve the CDP and we will be stuck and we will not uh, really have any uh, possibility to have leverage on what technology they choose to use. And that okay. might be, um, sorry, uh, they're gonna capture your uh, data, uh, your cell phone information, and a hacker may be able to, you know, get it. Uh, we, there's just so much information that is unknown and uh, I, I think that it's fair to the community to have uh, further uh, discussion uh, from Caltrans uh, to be an opportunity to ask uh, further questions. There's you know a lot been learned since the last uh, virtual meeting, and uh, there were many answers, uh, questions unanswered <clears throat> from that virtual meeting. Um, I believe they said that they were going to get back to us. I never, I never heard anything. Um, been busy with many other things. Uh, life gets in the way, and here we are. Uh, are we going to just say, you know, go ahead? Uh, we trust you, Caltrans. Do whatever you want. Is, okay. that, is that what this council really wants to do? With after listening to the testimony of the community tonight. Okay. Thank you, Dan. I. 
I would like to keep comments at this point specifically on are we going to approve this letter or not? Um, not go over things we've already talked about or maybe should have talked about, but just are we going to approve this letter? And I think Jill had something she wanted to say on that. Um, yes, just real quickly um, to Michelle's comments, um, Lisa's right. This is just the mid coast we're talking about. And although it would be nice to have some signs at Sharp Park, it doesn't really do us any good on the mid coast to have signs telling us, you know, how much traffic we're going to see because we're already stuck here. And there's really nowhere to evacuate to. And we all have cell phones telling us where to evacuate, which is pretty much the airport or the ocean. Um, I don't think the signs do anything except tell people you're going to have a long wait. So why don't you go to Sam's Chowder House or some other restaurant? Um, we looked at them before where they were set up. They were set up to direct people into the harbor and into the restaurants. So they're not, they're set up to direct tourists to stop and enjoy our services, not so much to help residents. Thank you. Len, did you want to say something about whether we should um, Just, just in comment, and I, as I said, I, I certainly was impressed by the points Michelle raised overall, so I plan to abstain. Well, okay, you're going to call the roll then? Oh, yeah. No, I didn't abstain from calling the roll. Okay, this, is, this motion will result in approving a letter with uh, changes noted on addressing, and it will be approved to send, correct? Correct. Okay, Dave. Yes. Michelle. No. Jill. Yes. Len, abstain. Dan. Yes. Greg. Yes. Claire. Yes. Motion passes 5-4, one against, one abstain. Thank you. Uh, is, is anybody here from the RCD at this point? I saw Kellex briefly earlier. Her name's on the screen. Yeah. Um, oh, Claire? Just, yes. just in closing, just a one comment. I think, uh, especially in this issue, but it was also shown from the dog off leash issue that uh, independent of what I did, many people here had very specific points to raise, and I would hope they would raise them articulately both to the commission and to the planner working on the project. Okay, that's a good point. Thank you. Okay, it looks I th we're going to close this item now. Um, but uh, I know I know there's more things that you wanted to, wanted to present. Oh, I think we're we're done. We did, which is uh, Kellex is here, and uh, she's going to speak to um, some a proposed a proposal to uh, modify the boundaries of the RCDs in. You, uh, Kellex, uh, please go ahead and, and explain to us uh, what we need to know. Thank you. I have a presentation. It's okay if I share my screen? Sure. Okay. Yeah, Hi, everybody. Let's see. Hello. Um, okay. So, um, I'm gonna, I wanna talk with you about the proposed change to the boundaries of the Resource Conservation District. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time saying what the RCD is first, because even though some of you are very familiar, some of you are somewhat familiar and some of you are not at all familiar. So I'll just talk about that and then talk a little bit about the, the boundaries and see if you have any questions or any, anything to offer. So uh, what the RCD is, um, we're a special district um, RCDs, there's about 100 in California. We were created in state law. We're independent special districts that were enabled in the California Public Resources Code. San Mateo County formed the first one in the state in 1939. Um, and there's about thousands more across the nation. Um, we uh, provide very diverse services to help people help with the land. We're sort of characterized as these boots on the ground and being a local hub for conservation. The RCD is the only public entity that exists for the purpose, the local public entity, that exists for the purpose of helping people help the land. And we share this mission with a federal agency, the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service, which we host and leverage in San Mateo County. 
So um, how we work um, is, I don't know if you can, if your screen, if this is blocking your screen, there we go. Um, we are uh, non-regulatory. We do voluntary conservation and we have very diverse tools. As I mentioned, we were created by the state of California um, for this explicit purpose of helping our communities by helping the land and very diverse ways of doing that. So we connect people with the technical, financial, educational assistance that they need to conserve and manage natural resources. We work directly with landowners and other mm -hmm. interests um, on a myriad number of topics. So, um, these are the areas of focus for us currently. Um, RCDs were designed to evolve with changing and emergent needs of both people in the communities we serve and the environment in the communities we serve. In recent years, that has enabled San Mateo RCD to bring resources and solutions for flooding, drought, fire, climate change, endangered species, et cetera. And, um, I mean, you've seen and heard many of our presentations about water quality. Maybe you haven't seen as much about what we're doing with uh, water supply and water conservation or climate mitigation, um, habitat restoration. A lot of our work, remember we were formed by farmers. A lot of our work is about agricultural viability in San Mateo County and resilience. And certainly you're familiar with one piece of um, the forest health and fire resiliency work that we do in San Mateo County because Sheena comes here and meets with you regularly. Um, and you know about like the chipping program and the El Granado um, wildfire resiliency project, but we've also got thousands of acres of forest health projects and fuel load reduction projects um, moving forward across the county. So just some examples of the kinds of things that we've worked on, um, reducing the, we addressed the flooding in Pescadero, the road into Pescadero, the annual fish kills of threatened steelhead trout, restoring habitat for endangered coho salmon, uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of acres of, uh, of just pure forest health projects. And of course, you're familiar with some of the fuel load reduction work that we do. Um, unfortunately, we were called upon after the fires um, to do post-fire recovery and technical assistance to help people recover from the fire in these wildland areas. Uh, we've helped with projects like this where one big storm event caused catastrophic erosion. Often it's smaller erosion, property by property or preventing erosion. Um, some of you have seen the videos that we've shown of um, working with partners to release 10,000 endangered coho salmon back into these creeks where we've removed dams and restored habitats so that they can thrive again. And other endangered species on the coast, the San Francisco garter snake, California red-legged frog, coho salmon, steelhead trout, marbled murrelet, um, all sorts of protected species here and farm by farm by farm, helping these farms with everything from um, uh, reducing regulatory barriers to production to um, water conservation, water quality coming off the farms, um, climate resilience of these farms, uh, et cetera. And about not just climate resilience, but also climate mitigation. So um, one of the things that we're deeply involved in is um, helping draw greenhouse gases down from the atmosphere and um, and storing it in um, in healthy soils and vegetation from which a lot of these greenhouse gases from the carbon was emitted. Um, this is an example. This on the bottom is a is a plan we did for Tomcat Ranch down in Pescadero, a site-specific carbon farm plan to help them um, maximize their ability to mitigate climate change, reverse climate change. So in San Mateo County, why is this not, um, why is it not going down now? I can't move the, it's weird. There we go. In San Mateo County, the 14 plans that we've completed so far um, if implemented fully, will sequester over 2,000, the equivalent of what over 2,000 acres of forests would per year, as if we put 2,000 acres of forest land here in San Mateo County, or took over 400 cars off the road for one year. So that's one of the type of things that we do. We work with cemeteries, uh, greenhouses, campgrounds, on um, water conservation, 
We um, are deeply involved in water quality monitoring and mitigation, with which I think many of you are familiar. We've worked with a lot of the, um, the just individual landowners on managing stormwater, managing manure from their horses or confined animals, um, water capture, impermeable surfaces, um, reducing runoff into, for example, Fitzgerald Marine Reserve and a lot of education and outreach to all sorts of different communities. Um, let's see, from top left to right, um, the top left is a program that we've done some sort of tailgate outreach programs with farm workers on um, water quality and watershed health. Um, the top center and right is a forum we held on Roundup, bringing together academics, ranchers, environmental groups to have conversations about Roundup. Bottom center, is a program we did with contractors and equipment operators on best practices in forests. Bottom left is with university students, um, et cetera. And so you put all that together, reducing flooding, protecting water supply, reducing risk of fire, sequestering carbon, restoring habitat, reducing erosion, improving water quality, agricultural viability, all of that at the landscape scale is um, really just towards building resilience in our communities. So that's a bit about the RCD and now about the boundary change. Um, so the proposed boundary change is, um, is intended to better represent um, where the district services and benefits are to be consistent with the sphere of influence. About a year ago, LAFCO changed our sphere of influence and this would correct our boundaries to be consistent with the sphere of influence better enable our services to be at an appropriate scale. Also be contiguous and not divide up communities. Like right now there's random pieces of Pescadero that aren't included or random pieces of the mid coast that aren't included or random parts of Pacifica that aren't included. Um, so to be more contiguous in our boundaries and also to be consistent with changes in statute. When conservation districts were formed in the 1930s, we were soil conservation districts, and we were basically intended back then as a farm services agency. And then in the early 1970s, the public resources code was amended. That's when our name changed and we became resource conservation district, and our authorities were broadened to be all aspects of natural resource management. And so this, back then, the, uh, the subdivisions weren't included because people weren't thinking about RCDs being involved in, you know, watershed-wide work, watershed health, or things that involve the built community or that sort of thing. So the boundaries um, right now are include a little over 33,000 properties in western San Mateo County from a little tip at the boundary with San Francisco to the boundary with Santa Cruz County generally from Skyline, Skyline Boulevard to the Pacific Ocean and exclude most of the developed residential areas. Notably, the RCD is able to work outside of our boundaries, which we have done, and our office is outside of our boundaries. Um, um, and um, certainly since that time, our program, since the 70s, our programs and services have expanded significantly with direct services and, and benefits to the areas that are not within our district boundaries currently. And then with climate change, wildfires, flooding, drought, sea level rise, erosion, biodiversity crisis, chronic water quality impairments, um, the need for our services in these areas um, is very real and expected to increase. So in recognition of these facts, LAFCO unanimously adopted an updated sphere of influence for the RCD in January, 2021, that more accurately represents where we provide services and where our benefits accrue. So the new sphere of influence includes areas currently excluded, um, portions of the city of Pacifica, unincorporated mid coast, including El Granada, Miramar, Montero, Moss Beach, and Princeton, portions of the city of Half Moon Bay, and portions of unincorporated south coast and extends the district's eastern boundary to Highway 280, including um, currently excluded portions of the towns of Woodside and Portola Valley. Um, so this map shows just as an example, um, RCD projects that in recent years have taken place in the areas that are currently um, excluded. 
So this shows the green is the proposed inclusion area, the yellow is the our current boundary area, and we didn't we didn't bother to include all of the projects that are in our current boundaries as well. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Cortese Knox Hertzberg Local Government Reorganization Act of 2000. That encourages that boundaries should of um, local government should avoid dividing an otherwise homogeneous area and that boundaries should reasonably include all territory which would benefit from an agency services. And the current our current boundaries uh, don't meet those criteria basically. Um, and so we um, intend to apply for a change of organization to redefine our boundaries to be consistent with our sphere of influence. And some of the frequently asked questions that have come up, um, people have asked whether this would result in any new requirements for property owners, residents, businesses, or others. The answer is no. Everything that we do is voluntary. Would this result in any new restrictions on property owners, residents, businesses, or others? No. If you're in the resource conservation district, does that affect your ability to, you know, put on an addition or, uh, you know, do an, ex an ADU or um, any of your activities? No, there's no restrictions that come from this. Would this result in any new fees or taxes? No, it wouldn't. So how do we pay for our services? We have a very small tax base of $70,000. And from that, we use that to leverage very diverse public and private funds via grants, interagency agreements, contracts for services, donations, et cetera. And per this table in recent years, the last year that we um, evaluated was the fiscal year that um, ended in 2020. At that point, we were leveraging $149 for every dollar of property taxes. This is pretty significant. This is good bang for the buck for, for government, I would say. Um, and this is where some of our funding comes from. So typically around 70% comes from state grants, state bond funded grants. Um, in recent years, in between like five and 12% of our funding has come from federal grants or, or contribution or cooperative agreements like grants. Um, um, that yellow box is non-county local, so that's like the Harbor District or um, Sewer Authority Mid Coast Side, those kinds of things, or we enter into agreements with them. That gray box is funding that has come from the county. Um, the light blue um, section is mitigation when sometimes, you know, when um, we've helped um, offset impacts from pg and &E or Caltrans by doing conservation work that they paid for. And then the small green on the top is other, other things like private donations. And um, we're, uh, some of you are familiar with the fact that we're a pretty lean organization. Our funding doesn't really, our funding is tied to very specific projects and tasks. So we do not have a single communications person. We do not have a single public information officer. We do not have, even though we're entirely dependent on grants, we do not have a development officer or a grants officer or any fundraising staff or a grants administrator. Um, we don't have a web person. We don't have any of that. We have one administrative officer and me. Um, and then Almost all of our, the money that comes to the RCD goes straight through to direct services to our constituents, an extraordinary amount here. So um, in those two re most recent years, seven and 8% was for administration and operations. So that's a little bit about our funding um, to explain you know, how we function, a little bit about the boundaries, a little bit about what the RCD is. I'll end here if anybody wants to do um, a screen save or take a picture with your phone to see ways that you can find out more about the RCD. Our website, um, we try to keep it updated. We don't have staff to do that solely, but we do our best to keep it updated. Um, a good place to get information, frankly, is YouTube. We often, if we're out in the field, we'll just do some rough cut with our own phones of what's going on and post it. Um, and then some of our social media is a good way to keep current. And also you can subscribe to our newsletter that comes out like maybe three times a year. And that is, um, you can find that on our website. And you can always contact me directly. And that's my email address. 
So I'm going to go ahead and stop the share and see if anybody has any questions or comments. I see a few in the chat and I'll look at that as well. Okay. This is an informational item. We're not going to be voting on anything uh, on this. You're just informing us so we know, right? That's right. Yeah. We also, um, we also, um, did uh, did CEQA on this, you know, and um, the, we didn't receive any comments on it. Um, and then our board is going to be um, considering the application and associated materials at its public meeting this upcoming Thursday, if anybody wanted to make comment there as well. Okay. Uh, so since we're not going to make any kind of deliberation, I'll take comments from uh, the council and the community in order. Uh, which, in which they were asked for, but I would, we're getting a little bit late, and if you could keep it to more like two minutes than three, that would be really helpful. So we'll start with Dan. Yeah, thank you, um, Kellex. Um, you, or, in your presentation, you, you uh, mentioned education on um, Roundup. Um, <clears throat> Caltrans just recently sprayed with either Roundup or something similar from Medio. Um, all the way to Main Street on the east side of the highway. And I'm wondering if uh, you're aware of that or, and also, you know, do you communicate to Caltrans or can you um, about this concern? Uh, uh, community members have brought it up to my attention. And well, uh, there's a, <laughs> I know that the community in general uh, uh, wants to reduce uh, any, doesn't like the use of uh, period. Well, um, well, there's a lot in that question. There's kind of a lot to unpack there. One is the RCD doesn't really get involved with advocacy, typically like taking a position on something like Roundup. And I want to be transparent that we use Roundup in certain cases um, when we find it to be the most effective um, tool and when considering various other alternatives. Um, certainly, I could talk with folks from Caltrans about that. Um, um, I'm not sure what the ask is. If the ask is for them not to spray or to, to tell people when they're going to spray or specific about how they spray or which things they spray or when they spray, I think that there would probably need to be more direction, but I could, I'd could i be happy to reach out to Caltrans and ask them to come to MCC if that's what you guys wanted or something like that. Yeah, they participate in various conversations about, about vegetation management. Yeah, I'm, I'm clear on there's a certain surgical, you know, extremely careful use of Roundup that really that uh, there's no other way to, for certain um, invasive species. I understand that. Um, but to just do a, a wide five foot um, spray, you know, right next to the drainage uh, ditches and uh, uh, um, property owner, people live right on the edge of the highway, you know, and um, so... I, it seems to be a valid concern, and uh, yeah, any help that you can, um, you know, at least just kind, of, yeah. Anything? I think what I could do, uh, you know, of, of course, as you know, I don't have any authority over Caltrans, but I do, I think, have an idea of who you could talk to, and I can maybe help make that connection for you. Okay. Thank you. Good, thank you, Lynn. Kellex. Can you see the screen I shared? I can. So at the El Granada Fire Station, that little yellow pin there, across Obispo in between Obispo and the State One, is a is a vegetated area that's owned by three different entities. That's sort of a, just a big mass of vegetation. When is this an example of where something sits outside your area? Or uh, uh, do you have any no. coverage for this particular? Um, so if something is outside of our area, we can still work there. And as I bet Barbara is about to talk about, um, we do have some involvement in that area. Did you want to talk about that, Barbara? I was just going to say some nice things about the RCD. But, oh, um, okay. <laughs> actually, they are a partner in environmental work, and uh, they did the management plan for the whole strip, which was kind of the the ground floor of uh, our looking at the property and what we would be doing there. And they are helping us with the plan and our environmental review. Yeah, I, I talked with Barbara, the other landowners are Caltrans in the county. So just curious, thank you. 
Yeah, we work with Caltrans, we work with the county, we work with public and private landowners, and we can absolutely help with that sort of thing. And RCDs are really built to be able to work across jurisdictions and boundaries and types of landowners. So for example, the um, the big dredge that we did down in Pescadero to address the flooding and fish migration, um, that went across state property, county right of way, and two private properties, one that was a farm and one that was conservation land to get that project done. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so Barbara, did you want to say something? I just wanted to just say that um, when I first moved here, I did some volunteering at the RCD and I have observed them in their various projects since then. And I think they're a really great organization, very efficient. And uh, I, I really admire the way they can bring different parties together to solve problems in a really effective way. Thank you, Sabrina, and then and then Sid, and then we'll call we'll close the comments. Yeah, thanks. Um, so first, wanted to mention that my my little cousin Jasmine has been working for several months now at Pie Ranch and Cascade Ranch, and I was fortunate to get a tour by her recently with the rest of the family. And we really enjoyed visiting um, those ranches. And I know that um, from what I heard, uh, they've done some work with, with uh, the RCD. So wanted to put that out there. Um, also, I know that, you know, typically you guys usually work on farms. Um, but I did want to mention that county parks could really do with um, some best practices on how to uh, handle vegetation. Um, number one, they do not seem to be um, able to, or I, I don't know, they don't seem to be doing much of anything about managing invasive species, species um, such as like, uh, well, I could name a few, um, but uh, obviously, like, um, pampas grass is a major problem uh, at Pillar Point Bluff and elsewhere. So that's an issue. Um, but what they do is they, you know, when they're trying to manage trails, which really don't need much management, they tend to uh, take out this machine, which is like a Caltrans style device, and they hack away at the native vegetation in the most obscene way you could possibly imagine. They literally devastate the vegetation on the Pillar Point Bluff trail to the point where I've actually been brought to tears over it, and so have two of my other neighbors, Chris Liang and Ed Lorenus. I know this because we've talked about it, and it is just so devastating and upsetting to see how they are um, mismanaging the trail system on the bluff. And um, speaking on behalf of you know some of my neighbors, we'd really appreciate it if, if the county could get some guidance on how to do that more appropriately. Um, they literally ruin the place and it's, it's unfortunate. Um, and then the last thing is, I, I know you guys have advised on drainage in Seal Cove in the past and, and you've done some work, especially near uh, TJ's house, um, but you know that stuff has kind of fallen apart and there are a lot of other areas of, of drainage concern in the neighborhood. And I don't know if there's an opportunity for you guys to work with the county on that, but things have really fallen into disrepair. We've got a lot of drainage problems. We've got a new landslide you might be aware of if you're not happy to show it to you. Um, we've got a whole lot of land movement that um, is happening because of a lack of proper drainage. So thank you. Yeah, so um, um, clar quick clarification, we haven't done any work up there in Seal Cove or around TJ's house. I think you might be thinking about some work that the county did years ago under a grant where we were a partner and then we did other work in different areas. So um, so we weren't part of that property. Um, you might want to contact, I think Julie Casagrande from Department of Public Works was really involved in that, would be a good contact for you. Um, you. And then um, let's see, the other thing regarding how like weighing in on how county parks manages vegetation or their programs, we're typically not likely to tell them how to tell anybody how they should um, how they should manage their lands, 
but um, but we do partner extensively with county parks and um, you know where we're invited we certainly provide input we work with them on a lot of vegetation management we've um, but in forests um, like we we're doing about we've been doing maybe eight or nine hundred acres of vegetation management um, as partners of the last year or two um, and um, and then we've also worked with them on repairing the old hall road and the Pescadero County Parks complex and um, removing a couple of dams um, to restore fish passage and and water conservation lots of other stuff so we certainly don't touch on everything they do um, but you know where we have resources and where their priorities were there were invited we certainly do and then the other thing Sabrina I saw that you had put in the chat you had asked um, if Tomcat accepted public funds for that work and they did not they paid us to do that carbon farm plan and um, and they um, and they were also really great because it was when, frankly, when we were learning how to do it and they were willing to be very patient with us in our learning process. They were kind of like a guinea pig as we were trying that out. And they let us fumble our way through to, as we developed our expertise around that. And they also have given us donations through the Tomcat Ranch Educational Foundation. Nice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sid, I, I lost track of my two-minute timer, but I, it's back, <laughs> so it's not You're not going to need two minutes from me. I just wanted to say to um, Kellex, thank you so much for doing so great amount of work on such a shoestring budget. Everybody appreciates it. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming and telling us, reminding us all the good things that you do. Um, for having me. We'll, sit, we'll, we'll you'll be back. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Bye. Okay, so the, the last item is we're saving it for the best. We had to reschedule it at an earlier meeting, but we're doing it tonight. And that is Barbara Dye, who is an expert on history of the area. And she's gonna, I hope, do several presentations for us, but she's starting tonight with Augmentata. So I'll turn it over to Barbara. Okay, let me, I'll be right there. Uh, share screen. Uh, there we go. And there we go. So first I wanna say that I am by no means a professional historian. I'm not even an expert in all of this. I'm just someone who has been lucky enough to move to El Granada, get interested in the history and sort of immerse myself in some of it. So this is just gonna be a pretty quick look at some of the cool stories of the first of four parts of El Granada history. So, Part one is Granada Synonym for Paradise, which comes from Barbara Vanderwerf's book about El Granada, which is really one of my basic um, core sources for this. So our history belongs, uh-oh, I need to move away. There we go. Uh, a long time ago, about 100 million years ago, when the Montero Mountain granite was formed down near Mojave in Southern California and came north on these parallel faults, uh, the San Andreas Fault and the Seal Coat so Cold Fault, which you can see in the slide here, uh, goes up to the Fitzgerald Marine Reserve. The Montero Mountain granite is uh, came from a magma chamber. That's what what makes a granite, and it's got quartz and feldspar and metallic minerals. And it's the quartz in this rock that makes our nice white beach beaches. So we should be grateful for the Montero Mountain granite. And because it is very solid and homogeneous, it doesn't shake as much as rocks with layers or sediments. And so it's a good base for if an earthquake happens. So I think our geology does impact what we're doing here. I have to move this. Maybe I can just, how do I hide this? Maybe I can do that. No, All right, just keep moving it. So We're not seeing anything except for the presentation, so you're good. Mm -hmm. You're not seeing we don't see anything. We do only see the presentation, nothing else on your screen. I know, it's just my, um, you know, the names, the people, the little block of the, um, 
is is blocking it for me so i can't read the words see the words so while the coast was moving northward ocean levels were rising and falling and then you had um sand and and um uh, silt and so forth putting down sediments and in the, in on the top of the old rocks and these are the ones that have lots of marine fossils in them so marine mammals shells and more and there's some really good fossil beds up in Fitzgerald just just to the north of Fitzgerald and then uh, these are relatively recent and were left by moving shorelines and those deposits are have very um, good at holding water and are very good for farming, which we will talk about later. So, so humans came on the scene, and I want to just stop for a second and, and say that a lot of the material here came from Matthew Clark, who's on the Granada board, and he spent his career as an archaeologist and recently retired. Uh, I also want to say that this is there's a lot of sensitivity around Native American history. So um, I have based a lot of this on Matthews, but if people are interested in some of the most recent science on this, they should go to the um, one of the groups that I'll mention at the end here. But again, I want to be careful because there are wonderful people who are talking about um, uh, the local history here for the earliest people who lived in this area before all of the foreigners came. So um, based on um, information I got from Matthew, that he, he feels that uh, people most likely came to California about 12,000 years ago. And there's arguments now going back and forth about that. But don't forget that the shoreline was much farther west then. The shoreline has, has come back since then. So there's not a whole lot of evidence of uh, the people who were here those that many years ago, because people mostly lived along the shoreline. Uh, about 1,500 years ago, the ancestral Ohlone arrived in this area, displacing earlier populations. So this area was occupied by the Native Americans, the Indians, for many centuries prior to the European arrival. And they lived mostly along the streams. Wherever there was a stream, there was a Native American, uh, an Indian uh, community. So the best current evidence is that um, this area was um, held by the Chiguan tribelet, and I may be pronouncing that wrong. They had several villages in this area. One was at Pillar Cedars Creek, and one was over near Pillar Point, and a third was probably up in Montera. Um, they undoubtedly traveled along the coast through El Granada um, in, just to enjoy the view and so forth. Um, they did manage their environment to improve it. They burned grass and brushlands, and uh, they adapted the environment very well. So they lived in these areas for many thousands of years. Uh, in 1912, Frank Brophy, who owned the Princeton by the Sea area, uh, drained Pillar Point Marsh to build a marina. And he found a large shell midden, which is uh, you know where they threw all the shells when they had a neighbor, uh, an Indian village and he found a lot of artifacts and so forth. Unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot of uh, record of exactly what he found, but based on that, he decided it was too complicated to develop that area, and he just uh, uh, sort of bulldozed it back and the marsh has returned. So over by Pillar Point Marsh is an important area for um, the local, the earliest inhabitants of this area. Um, then the later um, European arrivals called them Costanoans, which means people of the coast. Um, they mostly now call them the Ohlone, which is actually the name of a coastal village, so it doesn't really work. But there are various um, ideas of what the best name for people, and, and many of them are um, prefer to use the name Chiguan. Uh, I recommend that people look up the association of Rame, I think it's Rametush Aloni, which is um, a group that's doing a lot of really interesting and original work about learning about uh, the original owners of this land and um, their, see their ancestral responsibilities are to care for the earth and to care for the people who reside, reside here in their homeland. So there are groups that are um, active in this area. So if people want more information, that's a good place to go. So then the Europeans came. Of course, the first was the Port Portola uh, expedition, which came through this area in on October 30th, 1769. 
um, and the diaries of Father Crispy said, about nine o'clock in the morning, we set out carrying firewood from the creek, that was Pillar C of Creek, where there is a little, as the scouts reported, they had seen no wood where they explored, which is interesting. You know, the fact that there were not a lot of trees in this area. People think of them as uh, the natives of the Indians of um, using acorns, but that is a question. We know that they ate seed. They said there was no wood, and they went across the tablelands and flatlying hills. Um, and then they came to Pillar Point, but there was no wood anywhere around. They did not mention encountering natives between Pillar Cedos Creek and Pacifica. So they eventually the mission was established in um, up in. San Francisco, and they decided that they, you know, they wanted to have cattle and so forth. So they came down here where the hills made kind of um, a corral. That's what Corral de Tierra is. That's where the mission had its big ranch full of cattle to support the mission uh, because the mountains kind of hemmed in the cattle. And so they, uh, this was their area. And then in the, in the, early 1800s, the Mexican government uh, began giving large tracts of land to uh, the soldiers who had come up with the various missions and, and helped the mission. So in this area, uh, in the El Granada area, the land was given um, to Francisco Guerrero Palomares, who was a Mexican soldier. And he had married Josefa de Jaro, who was the daughter of one of the mayors of San Francisco, which then was called Puebla Buena. So we get our first sort of local, there's a lot of the history of El Granada area, and I go a bit bigger here, it is of individuals at this point who kind of come and make a difference in what goes on here. So the first one is Guerrero Palomares. So he lived in San Francisco, but he built an adobe over on Deniston Creek. And it's really sad that it was, wasn't preserved. In 1911, um, there was a Stanford University curator who really tried hard. It came really close to protecting it and preserving it. Um, it would have taken $300 to preserve it, but he wasn't able to raise it. So, so that money, that, that building is completely gone. Uh, I just went to the uh, Sanchez Adobe in Pacifica, and it would have been great if we'd had the local one here, but it's done, it's gone. Um, Guerrero was a really interesting man. He was um, a Californio, and he was very well respected by the incoming uh, people from other countries, the Americans and so forth. Uh, because he was so, so knowledgeable about all the various titles to the land from these various land grants, he was often called to testify. But then in 1851, and you know, I don't have time to go into it, but it's a really weird story of how you can read the newspaper accounts of, of how he was murdered in the city. And it was because of a land dispute and the land passed on to his widow. And one of the reasons that he may have been killed was because he was so knowledgeable about all of the land grants. Because at this point, we were starting to have lots of lawsuits between the um, rancheros, who were the Mexicans, and the Americans. And it didn't take very long because, before the various Americans managed to sue or negotiate um, most of the land away from the, uh, from the uh, Mexicans who had owned it. So, yeah. So I was surprised to find out that the first gold rush in California was in 1842. It wasn't really well known, but quite a bit of gold was found um, near, near, near on the other side of the bay. And that Im immigrants started coming from around the world, partly for that and partly because they just heard that California was a nice place and so forth. And when the Mexican-American War started, um, people began to talk about um, people who are part of the United States of America started wanting not only to take over parts of Mexico, but also to take over California. Um, Colonel Steph Stevenson's regiment came around Cape Horn in 1847, and they were here to, to take part of the, in the American occupation and to make the inhabitants feel that we come as deliverers. 
And this is important because there were two American men in that regiment who were very important on the coast side, James Denniston and Josiah Ames. And when they were discharged from service, they both tried prospecting, but it failed. And then they returned to San Francisco. So Denniston, somehow, nobody knows exactly how, met the widow of Guerrero Palomares and married her and became owner of the Corral de Tierra Land Grant. So he ended up owning this whole area and he started farming it and it was great farm country. But the problem was, how did you get it to market to sell it? Um, so he built the first wharf. It was um, called Denniston Landing or Potato Wharf and the steamers stopped there to load produce in the 1850. Um, again, I wish I had time to tell some of the really exciting stories, but um, evidently there is a committee of vigilance in San Francisco and they were coming after one of Denniston's friends because they thought was he was an accomplice to murder. So Denniston, who thought his friend, friend was innocent, um, organized an escape over Montero Mountain to the Adobe and then they fled to Southern Santa Barbara and they were arrested there and then they were tried and they were both found innocent. So. It's a great story. Barbara uh, Vanderwerf's book is really fun to read with all these great stories of the things that went on here on the coast side in the early years. Um, in 1865, he grew a record-breaking head of lettuce, five feet, eight inch, inches around and 41 pounds, which kind of like makes me think about the pumpkin festival. We need to have a El Granada lettuce festival in honor of Deniston. He became very wealthy. He represented San Mateo in the legislature. And when he died, the land was divided among Josefa, his widow, and her two sons. And she took this part, the, the El Granada part. And then Ames built a larger wharf a bit to the north, and Deniston's wharf, um, known as Old Landing, um, deteriorated. So we're getting sort of toward the end of the early history that I was going to cover today. So. Denison's friend Ames, who came with him on that ship, um, had had spent quite a bit of time in other areas, but then probably invited by Denison, he came here and began farming as well. And he built his wharf at the mouth of Medio Creek. And uh, Amesport, the little community there, was really successful, and they shipped potatoes and everything else to San Francisco. So he became a state legislature and a judge. And then when his crops had problems later, he closed down his wharf and then became the warden of San Quentin prison, of all things. So to finish up this little part, there have been a lot of different immigrants from lots of different directions on the coast side as we're looking at this part of the um, uh, 19th century, uh, we can see there were Irish, Chinese, Italians, English, Japanese, and Portuguese coming in. The Portuguese were interesting. They, of course, came from the Azores. They've continued to come through the years, islands in the Atlantic. Um, many tried gold prospecting. I think everybody who came tried gold pros prospecting, but it turned out to be harder than they expected. And they became laborers, raised money, and bought land. Others had, there was a whole whaling station at Pillar Point. Um, they hunted the whales offshore, took the boats out, killed the animals, towed them back in, and they um, turned the blubber into oil and big cauldrons. Um, some years they were there, other years they weren't. But then once the petroleum oil was really discovered and available for purchase, the whalers began going off to farms in the area. So we're going to just finish this early history of El Granada by looking, talking about trees. So the, all these farmers who were coming in from all over the world wanted a landscape that looked more like Europe, where they came from or wherever they came from. Um, they planted a lot of trees. And in the 1870s, the government got really behind uh, eucalyptus as the wonder tree. And the government provided all kinds of incentives for people to plant trees. Um, they, they sold them saying they, that now the redwoods were all cut down, they needed to have trees for building and so forth without mentioning that eucalyptus trees weren't really good for that. They were um, also said to be good because they grew so fast. And one of the other things was important was they sucked up all the water, which now we don't appreciate, but they thought this was good because it would reduce the exposure to malaria. 
So this is a picture of gum tree lane, which not everybody knows about. They were planted in the 18, late 1800s, and it went from near, near where Wilkinson School is now up to Quarry Park. And you can see what a big um, row of trees that was. There's some of these trees are still there, and you can see a few trees. People think that, that and if we continue with this history, we'll hear about it when we talk about Daniel Burnham and so forth, but he was against having eucalyptus or tall trees within the town. And uh, many of the tall trees and, and the areas um, uh, that are here on the coast side were planted much before that, partly because of government propaganda and government um, subsidies. So that's a quick look at the first, couple, well, millennia of um, the history. Next time, if we continue with this, we'll talk all about the railroad coming in and and um, how the big changes that were made, how Daniel Burnham and his um, City Beautiful movement uh, in, influenced things. And then the next part is the local far the farming that went on in the peninsula after the railroad failed. Um, some amazing stories about the gangsters and how the artichoke industry here on the West Coast was tied in with um, uh, gangsters in New York City. And uh, at one point uh, they stopped they refused to sell artichokes because of the crime on the West Coast. And then the last part will be about how we, how so many dedicated members of this community um, came together to protect it and uh, turn it into the wonderful place it is today. So there's a quick look at El Granada history for you. And again, this is the book that really gives you a sense of uh, what makes this community so special. Thank you, Barbara. I'm clapping. All right. <laughs> well, I hope that I know it's in a long meeting and it, I tried to be quick, but uh, it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool place to live. Some pretty cool stories of the, the past history. Claire's thanking you too, but she's <laughs> muted. Yes, okay, here we go again. Um, <laughs> can you take a few comments from people? Sure, yeah. We have a few. Uh, Steve um, and Lena. I think they're... Uh, <laughs> uh, it's hard for me to tell whose hands are up. I think Steve's, your hand is up, right? Uh, okay, my, my hand's up now. It wasn't before, but it is, it is now. Uh, I did have a question. Thank you very much for that presentation. That was really great. Uh, Barbara Vanderroof was my neighbor. She moved. She moved out. She and her husband moved out a long time ago. And I, I'd heard her husband passed away. Is is Barbara still with us? She is. And in fact, um, um, the way the way I got into specifically with um, El Granada is that I wanted um, someone from the RCD. In fact, asked me if we had a history of the Burnham Strip. So I started, you know, writing the history of the Burnham Strip. Of course, I used her book, and I was trying to um, find, get some rights to photos, and through a circuitous way, I ended up with her email, sent her an email, we ended up, she lives up in near Seattle, and we ended up emailing each other back and forth, and she said we could use any of her pictures, and the final upshot of it is that she has donated all the remaining um photographs and documents, including two full color 1910 railroad um, posters. And I have them and I'm going to catalog them uh, for the History Association. And then uh, we have an agreement with the History Association that we can use any of those materials in the new community center if we have a little history corner or if we have a little history museum at some point. So she, she was really engaged in helping us uh, improve our knowledge and she really uh, liked what we were doing. And it turned out and we both been Peace Corps volunteers, so. One other thing on your next presentation, I know, I don't know if it was in her book, I can't remember, but there was a poster for selling the land here Yes. Uh, so the property would only be sold to white persons. And I, it's a terrible oh, that part was of in history, the... but, but I think you should include it in your next presentation. Well, all of every, pretty much every community um, along the coast yeah. had those covenants and restrictions, you know. I think it's important for folks to know that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have the original 
title to, to to my house and it said that and it also said you couldn't drink in it either uh so, but dan yeah, well I, there was a lot of drinking in el gordata we'll talk about that a little later <laughs> dan go go ahead please yeah barbara thank you so much for that it's wonderful you know i'm i'm very interested in history and uh um <clears throat> uh you know it's just really um, i had the pleasure to um kind of kind of walk into one of your uh walking tours and that was that was wonderful just the same but uh yeah thank you so much um and i agree with you yeah, we are in paradise and uh you inspire me even more to you know protect what we have um for everybody you know not just the not just people live here but you know the the visitors and you know and visitors come from all around the world so it's just a beautiful place and you know the history is rich as you um you know uh shared with us tonight um yeah i'm just trying to say thank you the best way i can so um anyway i look forward to always working with you thank you for everything that you do for you know with uh you know gcst and all that stuff uh, everything okay all right. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate that. You're, you're welcome. All right. Bye-bye. Sid? I just wanted to comment on what Steve Terry said. And I, I'm a realtor and I have been since 94. And over the years, I've run across a lot of the covenants in the preliminary title reports. And I had one couple who was looking at a place in Trestle Glen in Oakland and came across it. And I said, I tried to kind of brush it off saying, well, it's illegal to enforce that covenant, covenant now. And that's just the way it used to be. And they were so out. Outrage. They were just infuriated that it's still in all the title reports. But I, I would tread lightly if you bring it up. That's all I'm saying, because it's a lot of people, you know, don't like to be reminded that they were other. And um, it's still a pretty sore subject. Thank you. Okay. Well, who well, let let you go then at that note, Barbara. Thank you so much, and we, we'll we'll get you on the schedule for the next one if you're willing. I'm looking forward to the artichokes and, and gangsters. Well, yeah, and well, and the and the whole railroad thing is amazing. You know, just exact what they tried to do and how their their vision and what they were able to accomplish. So anyway, I do get excited about it. <laughs> okay. Well, All right. Good night, everyone. Chapter. Good night. Okay, we can move on to council activity. Does anybody have anything they want to report on that they've done? A uh, quick report for me. Yes. So um, I'll amplify what Claire said at the beginning of the meeting. The reason we're not having a hybrid meeting tonight, um, aside from the fact that I am sick with COVID, is that um, GCSD's uh, attorney was of the opinion that things in, in the room that it might invalidate their declaration that uh, it's too dangerous for the GCSD board to meet in person. Um, I haven't gone back to them since the board of supervisors decided to have hybrid meetings, which I think would calm that down, but um, I will do that after I recover um, and we'll see how things go. So just want to pass that on. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Lynn? Yes. Um, a report, uh, we talked about Virginia Avenue um, a while back. I mentioned that we'd ask Caltrans to put a second flashing beacon above the first one there to make visible for the cars and they uh, expect to install that tomorrow evening they're telling me so that's movement there uh second uh we did a lot of work to uh, look at local hazard programs and to feed into the fema grant process and uh, ann ledwig who led that i know greg put a lot of effort into it uh, has informed me that they uh, she pulled together a team that included sheena brian kelly uh hannah from the county parks and Rich Sampson and worked up a proposal that they sent into 
FEMA, uh, uh, and it'll be next year, but it calls for to work with 12 sites in San Mateo County for uh, revegetation and management of things after the uh, the eucalyptus and other such things are removed. So that's one of the first real formal efforts to get grant support for it. So I think that's exciting. Okay, great. Anyone else? Um, moving on to um, coming agendas, just let me know, let me let you know that for the next meeting we do have two uh, fairly major things already scheduled. One is uh, Nicholas's uh, presentation of the Quarry Park Master Plan, and he's also prepared to deal with other parks-related issues. Um, and we're also going to pre we're going we're working on a response to the county's response to our letter about asking for lead control or absence of it at the airport. So that we'll, we'll bring that up to the next meeting as well. Uh, there's a whole list of things that we can talk about. Some of them are attached to this current thing agenda. Anybody who thinks maybe we're overlooking something or has an idea they want to sponsor or anything, say it now or, or send me an email and we'll try to deal with it. We'll try to include it, but, but the next meeting is pretty well set. Okay. Anybody else have anything right now they want to add or? Uh, how about a motion to adjourn? Okay. I move we I adjourn. I move we adjourn, of course. I'll second. Greg, was that Jill or Michelle? Michelle. That's Michelle. Michelle? Okay, <clears throat> let's uh, vote here. Uh, Claire? Yes. Greg. Aye. Dan. Yes. Me, yes. Jill. Yes. Michelle. Yes. Dave, and get well soon, Dave. Thank you. We're all done. So well. Get, well, get well, Dave. Sorry. Yeah. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody.